Good morning to grade 12s. We are looking at um, English Home Language Paper 2, which is a continuation of the question paper that we started with Section A. Um, and as such, we are now going to focus on Section B and Section C and uh, close it off. We are looking at our novels and then we're looking at our plays. So we are going to base our discussions on the questions that are in this question paper, and therefore we'll make sure that uh, we try and uh, piece together the mapping of our themes, characters, and um, everything that has to do with um, the play and the novel. Okay, without wasting any time, let's go to the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, and our discussion will be based on this essay which says, according to Wikipedia, immorality is the violation of moral laws, norms, or standards. It refers to an agent doing or thinking something they know or believe to be wrong. Immorality is normally applied to people or actions, or in a broader sense, it can be applied to groups or corporate bodies and works of art. In a well-constructed essay of 400 to 150 words, which is roughly two to two and a half pages, discuss whether Dorian Gray can be considered a completely immoral character or whether he is merely a victim of influence. Okay, when we're coming to the picture of Dorian Gray, we must understand that we look at it from an angle of um, immorality according to the question. So as such, we need to now discuss whether Dorian is independently immoral or whether he is a victim of influence. Uh, when we start off, we definitely agree that he was a victim of influence. He is a victim of influence. We maintain the present tense. And therefore, the influence, when it takes uh, um, over and uh, control, ultimately pushes him now to make independent decisions. And therefore, we cannot condone him because he made the decisions knowingly and uh, fully aware of their consequences. All right, let's get uh, to our question and see what we can bring up. We are exploring this too, the morality and the influence. So let's try and see whether our complex character was Dorian Gray is going to bring up all of this. Remember when we're writing the essay question, we always use our peel. May we never forget that we follow our peel method. So, Please, let's make sure that we discuss using the pill. Let's make sure that we discuss using present tense as well. We must maintain the present tense. You must be able to produce the 400 to 450 words, which is two to two and a half pages. We always use this as our guide. This will always take us to making sure We've given them and given markers everything they need. And roughly we're talking about six to eight paragraphs of discussion that can come in for you to give valid points and discuss them in the pill method. So as such, we must be able to bring it across. All right, let's see what we come up with when we come to Doreen Gray. Firstly, let's look at um, the influence. We're going to talk about the external influence. Our first point Let's take this down a little bit. Okay, we're going to talk about the external influence from um, um, uh, from Basil in the portrait. So when we are talking about external influence, we must be able to break down what we mean. Right. We're going to talk about external influence. We're going to also talk about... Um, immoral character right so those are the two things we will consider today when we talk of external influence we are definitely going to bring in the portrait um, by basil when we talk of the portrait we're talking about um the need for eternal beauty Beauty. We're also going to talk about Lord Henry. I'll just write the H there and his influences. 
So as such, these are the things that come in as external influence. We're going to talk about the yellow book. It also comes in there. So those are the uh, external influences that we mean when coming to um, Dorian Gray. Uh, but now when we talk about immoral uh, behavior of Dorian Gray, we are going to um, talk about his choices. Yes. Um, when you talk about choices, Killing Basil definitely comes in. Uh, blackmailing Ellen Campbell comes in. Right. That's where we see his immoral character. And therefore, we must be able to bring it out because those were conscious choices that he made. So when you're talking about immorality with Dorian, we're talking about conscious choices. We must be able to specify. So we're just opening up and making sure before we write our essay, we know exactly what we're going to do. Now let's see how far we can go because when we are counting and saying it's your pill, six to eight paragraphs, there's your first point, there's your second point, there's your third point, there's your fourth point, there's your fifth point, which means we, we can add something as well. Um, Sibyl vein, treatment of Sibyl vein also comes in, definitely. Treatment of Sibyl vein. That's coming in as well. We are going to also talk about that one. Um, because that shows his um, moral journey towards uh, 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 destruction. So those are the things that we might bring in here and there. And therefore, let's try and um, discuss fully. All right. I'm, I'm just going to be discussing so that you can be able to understand what I mean when I say the portraits, the North Henry's influences, the yellow book, so that we can be able to do that. All right, let's start with um, Lord Henry's influences. I, I believe that's where we start off from. Um, Lord Henry is a philosopher, and Lord Henry's uh, um, obsession with Dorian clearly pushes him to make Dorian an experiment. But now we're going to talk about his philosophy of um, hedonism, Aesthetism, um, you will grow old and not be this beautiful anymore. Enjoy life while well, at least you're still young. So those are the things that we're talking about. But his philosophies in the garden scene uh, definitely promote um, and push Dorian to uh, deviate from the normal norms of society. Because now Dorian becomes uh, um, eager to embrace these ideas that Lord Henry gives him. So he is entranced and captivated by Lord Henry's rhetorical philosophies because he keeps re repeating them. So as a result, from the expression of the philosophies, we get to uh, see Dorian uh, uh, desiring to become young forever. We see Dorian desiring to explore a new life of pleasure seeking so those are the philosophies that we're talking about when we say those are the external influences that lead dorian to his transformation so what do we mean by transformation dorian is a virtuous a, a, a naive innocent young man who unfortunately is entangled um, into a morally corrupt uh, philosophical man who is Lord Henry and therefore um, becomes influenced. The influences from Lord Henry become successful to a point because Lord Henry is so charismatic. Lord Henry is so fluent and uh, um, very easy with the tongue, which now becomes the key role in Dorian becoming a morally corrupt. 
So definitely we are saying Lord Henry's philosophies promote Dorian to want to indulge uh, from the indulge in new experiences that he is uh, explained to by Lord Henry. And therefore, that's the external influence that we mean to say the philosophies play a very significant factor when it comes to Dorian's moral corruption. His choices as he makes going on are now influenced by these ideas. In other ways, we're saying Lord Henry's philosophy becomes the foundation and the basis of the moral, immoral choices that Dorian makes. So we also going to talk about the portrait because immediately after the garden scene, we we find um, Dorian going back to the studio with Basil uh, to see the the finished portrait. When he sees the finished portrait, he realizes for the first time how beautiful he is. When he realizes how beautiful he is, he now desires to become beautiful forever. And therefore, that's when he wishes uh, for the portrait to remain, uh, to take his place and he remains young forever, which means the portrait must grow old and he must remain young. The Faustian bargain being the immorality that arises from Lord Henry's philosophies. So it is a chain of events because the the philosophies that Lord Henry instills in him in the garden scene to that his beauty will not last forever uh, pushes Dorian to go and make the first end bargain when they are back in the studio with Basil. And now we realize that the portrait now, when the first end bargain is made, he, his soul exchanges with the portrait. So now we realize that when he loses his soul, that is the start of his immorality. When he now is uh, uh, um, free from uh, um, any, any guilt, he becomes immoral. So the portrait is also something which is symbolic when it comes to Dorian's true nature. Uh, it's a mirror that unveils the darkness in him or within him. So as such, the portrait gradually deteriorates um, as he sins more in the real world. Therefore, that shows his inner moral decay. So when Dorian engages in a lot of sins, I always call them sins, the immoral uh, acts that he does, I call them sins. When he engages in those immoral sins or acts, the portrait becomes increasingly distorted. It becomes increasingly grotesque. So as such, the, the transformation is now the, the, the proof that Dorian started off as a victim of external manipulation, uh, but now he is an active participant in his own moral degeneration. So, which means he willingly becomes immoral because he realizes that the more he does the, the, the sinning, the less society knows and the less it is on him because it is only a reflection or a mirror in the portrait. So now we we realize the symbolism of the portrait because that's that's the thing in the book that gives us Dorian's true nature. So that's what we mean when we're talking about external influence about the portrait, about Lord Henry. Let's go to the yellow book. The yellow book is given as a, a present from Lord Henry. And therefore, unfortunately, it's the one that I, I, I'll say I, ironically, the influencer who's Lord Henry gives Dorian the yellow book. And ironically, the yellow book uh, replaces the influencer because when he's given the yellow book by Lord Henry, he now adapts to the yellow book and therefore uh, moves less from Lord Henry's grasp. The yellow book is an aesthetic symbol, symbol in the book because it has to do with, um, what do we call it? Colors. Uh, we know symbolism of colors, different days as have different colors, yellow, blue, whatever it is. But now when we see him uh, uh, binding the book in the different colors and adapting to the character and therefore he takes the 
character's uh, life and brings it to himself, we now realize that it becomes uh, uh, something that he transits into. So he becomes a full hedonist and aesthetic uh, uh, symbol when he leaves out the yellow book, buying things unnecessarily that he doesn't even need or use, the purchasing of a lot of uh, uh, um, material things. So changing moods according to the colors and the days, that's when we realize that he leaves it out. We do agree that it is an external influence that's given to him, but he actually now leaves it out and becomes the immoral character that it is. And therefore that's where we realize that there is a very intricate pattern with, uh, from external influence to the immoral character that he becomes. The, the immoral character and the external influence end up intertwining. Why? Because it becomes complex. It starts off as external influence and ultimately leads to his immorality. And therefore, that's why we, when you are discussing, you must be able to state what the external influence is and what it ultimately leads to. They are stepping stones. So the portrait, Lord Henry's influence, the yellow book, are stepping stones to Dorian's immoral character, becoming more degraded, becoming more grotesque as the portrait becomes. So that's how we are now bringing in those things. And then when we also talk about um, the yellow book, I believe he, that's where the full aestheticism of Dorian is seen. And we must be able to bring it out that um, when we say fully uh, uh, aesthetic, we, we, we are talking about um, the, the issue of um, um, corrupting influence on his youth um and, and as such he changes and uh is led by the moods and the colors that influence his life and that's what we bring now so let's sum up the external influence before we move on to the immoral character the portrait it definitely symbolizes the changing state of Dorian's soul the yellow book it represents a, a, a Dorian at an older uh, uh, age and his corrupt corruption becoming more uh, intense. Um, we, when we are bringing in the portrait, we are talking about the start of his of losing his soul and leading to his immorality. So that's what we mean when we're talking about the the three things. Let's go to the moral character. The choices that he makes knowingly cannot be ignored. Killing Basil was a, a conscious choice. Why? Basil made him face, face his true self and what he has become. Basil being in denial more and more and still wanting to defend him as his voice of reason angers Dorian because the more Basil uh, defends him in saying you are not what you have become you need to repent uh, 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 change your ways the more now Dorian resents Basil and that's why he easily blames Basil for what he has become that builds to hatred which pushes him to consciously step Basil several times and we now realize his immorality when after killing Basil he terms his cops a thing. He cannot look at it. He calls it a thing and becomes detached emotionally. From a mentor that Basil uh, uh, became in his life to a cops that he calls him now uh, and to a thing that he calls his cops makes us realize the immorality in Dorian and the extent to what it has become. And as such, we're also going to talk about the blackmailing of Ellen Campbell, knowing very well that Ellen would have refused to come. He writes on the notes, um, uh, uh, he writes uh, something on the notes, which when Ellen reads, uh, pushes him to, forces him to come uh, uh, to Dorian and do as he bids. 
we now realize that whatever he wrote on the piece of paper was damning uh, evidence against Ellen or was a reminder or was a threat, blackmail as we call it. And therefore, Ellen Camps, he knowingly blackmailed Ellen Campbell uh, um, and as such, he forces him to come and dispose of Basil's corpse. And therefore, that's what we call by immorality in Dorian. Already, uh, Ellen did, did not want anything to do with Dorian. But he is blackmailed and therefore comes and does the deed all the same because of what Dorian holds over him. That is what we call immorality in Dorian or the immoral character that he has become. The extent of his cruelty, the extent of uh, uh, corruption on another soul and still continuing to corrupt him. Ultimately, Ellen Campbell commits suicide because he realizes that Dorian will not stop. As much as he had promised that he will not contact him, he did contact him and blackmail him to uh, come and dispose of the body using chemicals um, of Basil. And therefore, that's what ultimately leads Basil, um, Ellen Campbell to commit suicide is he cannot bear the thought of uh, 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 doing something else for Dorian again. He knowingly pulls in Ellen Campbell into his uh, scheme and forces him to do the unthinkable, which is to dispose of a body. And therefore, that's corruption on Ellen Campbell again. So we're also going to talk about um, the cruelty treatment of Sybil. Consciously rejects Sybil and is cruel to her after her performance of uh, uh, um, portraying her true feelings of love on stage. He denies her and says he does not want anything to do with her again because she was not the Juliet that he wanted on stage or, 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 or the character that Sybil was supposed to portray for his uh, uh, aesthetic enjoyment and artistic enjoyment. And therefore, he now uh, uh, is cruel to Sybil. So that's what we, we are talking about when coming to how consciously corrupt uh, Dorian is. So this is what we are talking about uh, when it comes to uh, this essay. It's a discussion. So we realize that he believes that when he is cruel to Sybil, it's because he still wants to see the artistic uh, uh, Sybil on stage, the Elizabeth, the Juliet or whatever character she's supposed to be, despite it being wrong. But we realize now uh, the extent of his immorality when the next morning uh, he sees, um, early hours of the morning, he sees the line of cruelty on the mouth of the, of the portrait. And then he decides that he will go and apologize to Sybil uh, uh, to make it right. And then when he hears of her death from uh, Lord Henry, he, he decides to continue with the hedonistic life and the same evening uh, of the same day that he discovers Sybil uh, has passed away, he goes to the theater and uh, continues with his um, hedonistic lifestyle. This is where we're talking about immorality now. To say he does not grieve for Sybil, uh, is detached, and therefore continues with his life as if nothing has happened. So those are the things that we are touching on uh, when it comes to this essay, because definitely we consider him both. He becomes completely immoral. That's very true. He started off as, a, as merely a victim of influence, but he continues as an immoral character knowingly, consciously, and uh, all decisions that he makes now as an adult are based on him going back to check the portrait in the schoolroom and see what it has become. Uh, lock the, the portrait, put the key in his breast pocket and continue with life. So that's what we mean. When we are also talking about how he influences Lord Ken's son and how the rumors in society are spreading that he destroys uh, the lives of the young men that's the immoral character we're talking about. And therefore, I believe Lord Kensan is one example. I believe Adrian Singleton is another one that he introduced to this hedonistic life and corrupt life. 
But now, unfortunately, Adrian Singleton loses himself and is even physically degraded. So those are the things that we are talking about when it comes to his immoral character. So as such, which means this question touches on both parts of Doreen Gray being in a victim of external influence, but ultimately becoming an immoral character, willingly, consciously, because it's based on his choices. So that's what we are touching on when it's coming to this essay. Practice essay writing, please, before we write our paper too, and make sure that as long as you have your points, you are able to have a fully fleshed essay. I always guide my learners to say, please plan your points as I have done as well, to say, I have that point, I have that point, I have that point, which will guide you to making sure you touch on the points. Ultimately, all of them will be discussed and you can have some full marks being given to you. So as such, just try it out and practice before the exam starts so that you can get uh, um, uh, maximum points when it comes to any essay that you are going to choose, uh, whether it's a play or a novel. All right, let's continue to our context questions of Dorian Gray. All right, question seven. Yes, it's this one. All right, when we come to question seven, it's based on the extracts, right? And our extract is from chapter, chapter four. All right, let's go and see what we had. I will tell you, Harry, but you mustn't be unsympathetic about it. After all, it never would have happened if I had not met you. You filled me with a wild desire to know everything about life. For days after I met you, something seemed to throb in my veins. As I lounged in the park or strolled down Piccadilly, I used to look at everyone who passed me and wonder with a mad curiosity what sort of lives they led. Some of them fascinated me. Others filled me with terror. There was an exquisite poison in the air. I had a passion for sensations. Well, one evening about seven o'clock, I was determined to go out in search of some adventure. I felt that this gray, monstrous London of ours, with its myriads of people, its sordid sinners and its splendid sins, as you once phrased it, must have something in store for me. I fancied a thousand things. The mere danger gave me a sense of delight. I remembered what you had said to me on that wonderful evening when we first dined together about the search for beauty being the real secret of life. I don't know what I expected, but I went out and wandered eastward, soon losing my way in a labyrinth of grimy streets and black restless squares. About half past eight, I passed by an absurd little theater with great flaring gas jets and gaudy playbills, a hideous Jew. And the most amazing waistcoat I ever beheld in my life was standing at the entrance, smoking a vile cigar. He had grisly ring ringlets and an enormous diamond blazed in the center of his old shed. Have a box, my lord, he said when he saw me, and he took off his head with an air of gorgeous civility. There was something about him, Harry, that amused me. He was such a monster. You will laugh at me, I know, but I really went in and paid a whole guinea for the stage box. To the present day, I can't make out why I did so. And if, yet if I hadn't, my dear Harry, if I hadn't, I should have missed the greatest romance of my life. I see you are laughing. It is horrid of you. All right, let's go to our questions. This is from chapter four. Refer to lines three to four, it says, uh, Okay, let's quickly go and see what line four say up to veins. It says, for days after I met you, something seemed to throb in my veins. That's what we are using as the basis of this question. Explain what something is. Um, explain what the something is that Dorian mentions. Okay, uh, curiosity, I believe, plays a big part here. Yes. I believe we're going to touch on curiosity. Okay, uh, let's go touch on, yes. Curiosity is one of them. Um, curiosity of uh, new things, unknown things. Definitely. Uh, I believe we can also talk about excitement. to experience new things. 
discussion also comes in here for new experiences. The new experiences also comes in. So this is what we can refer to uh, when it comes to this. Uh, and I believe uh, we, we are talking about the issue of that uh, he's feeling free to explore, explore, discover, free to explore, discover things that he did not know before or did not have the courage to do before. So that's what we are touching on. Refer to line six to seven. Then there was an, okay, let's quickly go back and see what we are talking about. It says, then there was an exquisite poison in the air. All right, it says, comment on the effectiveness of this image. When we say uh, poison in the air, um, I believe what is dangerous to him is now attractive. What is danger is, is attractive to him. He is attracted to danger. Dorian is attracted. Dangerous things. Unknown territory. The thrill of it is what we're talking about here. And I believe when you say there was poison in the air, that, that will be a metaphor, right? Yeah, the metaphor. Definitely a metaphor. That's the if image that we're talking about. So we, we are definitely bringing in um, poison is, is dangerous, but something exquisite is beautiful, attractive. So that's what we mean. can be an oxymoron as well. Yeah, can be an oxymoron because we have poison, but also exquisite. So that's oxymoron. It's total opposite. Poison is dangerous, but we're talking of beautiful and uh, attractive. So that's what we mean. And then 7.3, by looking closely at the diction used to describe London, discuss how Oscar Wilde's opinion of the city is revealed. I believe to talk about sorted sinners, right? Grey monsters, grimly streets. Uh, filthy is what is coming into mind. Dirty, sorted. Those are the ideas that are coming in there. Uh, we're also talking about um, um State of decay. That's what we mean. Critically discuss what Dorian's description of the theater manager reveals about his character. It is Jew, I believe. Yeah. Let's go back to that description. I believe he said it is Jew. Yes. It is Jew. Yes. In the most amazing waistcoat I ever beheld in my life was standing at the entrance smoking a vile cigar. He had a he had grisly ringlets and an enormous diamond placed in the center of his soul shirt. I have a box, my lord, he said when he saw me. All right, all right. He was such a monster. Uh, all right. File. Uh, all right. All right. Idias. So that's a description that he gives us. We just had to go back and see exactly what was said. All right, what does it reveal about his character according to those descriptions? Uh, I believe um, he, he is showing a bias that's prejudiced, right? Yeah, he's prejudiced against the Jew. He's prejudiced, sorry. Prejudice, he is prejudiced against the Jew, definitely. Uh, and also, I believe um, standards, fashion standards, criticizes his criticizes his um, fashion standards, demeans him. 
think those are the things that are coming in when it comes there. Uh, judgmental, just as society has been judgmental. Just as society is judgmental to those that are, the elite are judgmental to those that are in lower class. And he's doing exactly that. Explain why Dorian's belief in 7.5 that he has discovered the greatest romance of his life is ironic. Definitely irony. What are we talking about? Uh, for Dorian, it is not love. I think we all know that. He's not in love. He's really not in love with Sibel but is in love with the characters that she plays. So the irony is in, um, irony is in not in love with Sybil. but in love with the characters Sybil plays. Sybil plays on stage. I think we talked about it above in the East when we say that Juliet, that she is when it's Roma and Juliet. So that's what we're talking about. All right. Cleopatra, when she's playing Cleopatra on stage, is what he is in love with. So that's the irony that we're talking about. Uh, that's why as soon as she displeases him by not acting well, he loses his love for her. I believe we call it loses and put it in quotes because he is cruel to her because he says he is not in love with her anymore. So that's the love that we're talking about because it's not love, it's this one that we put in quotes. Thank you. Just as we put loses in quotes. All right, let's go to extract B. All right, extract B is from chapter 10. All right, let's go to the questions. Uh, let's go to the extract quickly so that we know what we're dealing with. It says, I don't want to put it straight lip. I only want the key. Well, sir, you will be covered with cobwebs if you go into it. Why? It hasn't been opened for nearly five years, not since his lordship died. He winced at the mention of his grandfather. He had hateful memories of him. That does not matter, he answered. I simply want to see the place. That is all. Give me the key. And here is the key, sir, said the old lady going over the contents of a bunch with tremulously uncertain hands. Here is the key. I'll have it off the bunch in a moment, but you don't think of living up there, say, and you so comfortable here. No, 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 he cried petulantly. Thank you, Liv, that will do. She lingered for a few moments and was the ruler's offer some detail of the household. He sighed and told her to manage things as she thought best. She left the room, breathed in smiles. As the door closed, Dorian put the key in his pocket and looked up and looked round the room. His eye fell on a large purple satin coverlet heavily embroidered with gold. A splendid piece of late 17th century Venetian work that his grandfather had found in a convent near Bologna. Yes, that would serve to wrap the dreadful thing in. It had perhaps served often as a pole for the dead. Now it was to hide something that had a corruption of its own, worse than the corruption of death itself. Something that will breed horrors and yet will never die. What the worm was to the corpse, his sins will be to the painted image on the canvas. They will mar its beauty and eat away its grace. They will defile it and make it shameful. And yet the thing will still live on. It will be always alive. Explain why Dorian winced at the mention of his grandfather. Okay. Uh, we we remember that uh, the grandfather did not approve of his mother's marriage uh, as, the, as Dorian's father was a servant. So the grandfather had the father killed. So he did not treat Dorian well. That's why he kept him secluded most of the times in the schoolroom. So I believe it is the, 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 the wincing is because of the treatment from the grandfather towards him being locked in the schoolroom for a long time and his um, disapproval of the mother's marriage and having the father killed. Comment on Dorian's view 7.7 .7 of the painting is a dreadful thing. 
when we say dreadful thing, we realize uh, ugliness. He sees the ugliness that it has become, that it is showing ugliness. He sees in the portrait. In the portrait. So that's why he calls it a dreadful thing, because uh, um, when he looks at the portrait, he finds the change on his face dreadful because it reflects the ugliness of his sins. Uh, he is repulsed uh, by the ugliness that he sees, and therefore that's why he distances himself because he does not want to face the true reflection of what he has become. He cannot bear the thought of losing his youth and beauty that he has. And that's what makes him see the dreadfulness there. Discuss the effectiveness of the images in these lines. Um, we saw uh, what the worm it says. Um, let's go back to 19 to 20. Let's look at the image that is given to us. It says uh, what the worm was to the corpse, his sins will be to the painted image of the canvas. So they say discuss the effectiveness of the image in these lines. Um, worms eat away a dead body until the body is decayed and deformed. His sins have eaten away the beauty of his face. His face on the canvas has been eaten away by his, his sins. That's why it's disfigured, grotesque, disformed, because it's being eaten away by his sins. His soul is becoming more rotten with the sins that he continuously commits. And therefore, it will destroy that beautiful face on um, the painted portrait. So that's what we mean by the image of uh, worms eating away a dead body. Sins are eating away his... Uh, beauty and his soul. So that's what we mean, 7.9. Refer to line 17 to 18. Um, using these lines as a starting point and based on your knowledge of the novel as a whole, well, critically discuss how lack of accountability is typical of Dorian Gray's character. He chooses to hide the image, right? Uh, that's why he locks it away in the schoolroom because he is avoiding the confrontation with himself of what he has become. So it, when he hides the portrait, he's hopeful that he'll, he'll maintain his innocence and his beauty outwardly. So not taking responsibility for his actions is what his character adapts to. The more he becomes corrupt, corrupt the more he does not take accountability. So for example, civil suicide, he is never made accountable for it. James Vane dies before he can face him. So he never, Basil's death, he's never brought to justice or made accountable for killing Basil uh, because it's all about shifting blame for him. So as such, this is what we mean to say when he shows no remorse, he shows no regret, of his immoral actions, then we understand that's why he is not seeing the need for accountability to happen. That's our picture of Doreen Gray, 25 marks each. Either you choose the essay or the context, but you must be able now to have your knowledge clear. And therefore, as we are discussing, we're trying to revise our knowledge and our content as well, so that we can put in place what we know. All right, let's go to Life of Pi for those who are doing Life of Pi. Okay, Life of Pi is a question. Pi experiences a journey of suffering and hardships on the lifeboat. He was forced to abandon more and more of his humanity in order to survive, something which haunts him even after he has settled in Canada. In a well-structured essay of 400 to 450 words, approximately two to two and a half pages, critically discuss the validity of the statement. I'm going straight to the discussion. Remember, this is a book on symbolism. This is a book on narration, different uh, uh, voices. So we must be able to differentiate when we're doing the life of pie. All right. It says, uh, 
experience is a journey of suffering and hardships on the life boat. Um, he was forced to abandon more and more of his humanity in order to survive. Haunts him even after he is settled in Canada. Okay. When he is on the lifeboat, he is uh, a bait for the hyena, isn't it? That is on the boat. But now we, we also realize that uh, the hardships are the skills that he has to adopt to survive not being eaten um, as part of the food chain that is in the boat. So we now realize that um, he is tested. He is able to depend on the stored supplies that he has for a while. But when they start to uh, lessen and uh, finish, he is forced to assume more responsibility of how he can survive. So which means adaptation had to happen. Um, new survival skills had to be uh, de devised. So that's what we are talking about. Also responsibility of taking care of Richard Parker, which means he has to have his meat on a routine basis of some sort. He has to now violate his own beliefs of his religion about killing. But now as his food supply is also finished, he is forced to consume the meat as well and eat it. So that's what we are talking about on the boat there. Um, also, um, he defines his time on the boat as suffering, uh, which leaves him shattered for a while. He loses muscle mass rights, retains water, goes blind, becomes weak. He suffers permanent scars from the exposure to the weather conditions and develops, um, uh, what is this, an aversion to salt afterwards. Um, so as such, Richard Parker becomes a, 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 an existing symbolic dominant figure in his life. Because Richard Parker was not just uh, 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 something that we can just say was also stranded with him on the boat. No, it was a form of companion of some sort. But it was also a constant reminder of death, that death is imminent, death can happen. So as such, it kept him on his toes. So that's what we are talking about. Um, also, you could have discussed the issue of um, taking care of himself. From a young age, he has been able to accomplish things and take care of himself. He has been shielded by his parents, isn't it, from all forms of harm. And therefore, um, he was always friendly with the zoo animals until his father had to give him the lesson on uh, giving the goat to the tiger so that he can know the nature of the animals. Uh, they also, parents also emigrate to Canada to avoid the potential uh, political unstableness that can um, affect him as India was uh, affected. So as such, we realize that uh, he accomplishes a lot of things on the boat, which is to survive the tiger, and therefore he's able to uh, become a survivor. Um, in Canada, he's haunted by nightmares. Um, uh, Richard Parker is one of the nightmares, uh, companion to him, but also a symbol of death, uh, it, that he actually never comes to term with even at an older age. He fails to adapt to that and he never does. That's why it haunts him for a while. Um, I think even when he's older, his home is filled with food. It's a constant reminder that I ran out and therefore he never wants to go through that horror again or trauma of uh, losing uh, uh, food again or running out of food. Also, his home is filled with religious symbols. Is uh, He never wants to experience spiritual deprivation again. He never wants to feel like he's without any religious support of any sort. Um, I believe also the hiding of his family from the author. It's almost like he's trying to compensate for the loss of his own family before the shipwreck uh, because he feels guilty. Absence of family 
treasures, mementos. Um, so it's a reminder for him constantly of what he has lost. Um, he overdresses as well, as if to compensate for his lack of control over his uh, body changes, body temperature changes on the lifeboat. Uh, he stands out from the family. He's between cultures. He hasn't really become settled in Canada, and therefore he can not have. He doesn't have anything to identify with because he's caught in between because of the traumas that you went through in the boat. So you had to bring um, the lifeboat and make a connection to his Canada life of what is similar of what happened here and how it's a re it's reflected here in his other life. So that's what you could have touched on the... All right, let's go to the context. Uh, because of time, I'm not going to read. I'm just going to go straight to the questions. What does Pi still not understand about the um, Tim Tom? All right. Um, Tim Tom or Tim Tam, whatever you called it. All right. Um, all right. Uh, why did it sink? I think that's the biggest question that he couldn't understand. Why? What was the real reason of the uh, shipwreck? The reason of the shipwreck is what he cannot understand definitely it's one mark explain the iron of the diction used by pi to describe the ship in paragraph one uh let's go and see what we'll take out from that paragraph one quickly paragraph one he says i don't understand what days the ship had pushed on bullishly indifferent he says pushed on We're definitely going to discuss pushed on Foolishly indifferent, I believe, is also coming in. Um, massive confidence, yes. Slow, massive confidence of a continent. Any of those were applicable, I believe, yes. Any of those were applicable, you could have taken any of those. Okay, let's go see how many marks was it. Explain the irony of the teaching used by Pi to describe the ship in paragraph one. Um, superior in strength, can endure anything, yet the ship failed and sank all the same. So I believe that's what we mean by indifferent to its surroundings. So confidence of a continent. So the, 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 the boat, the, the, the ship is superior and strong and can endure anything but it mechanically fails and sinks still. So that's what you could have discussed there is the irony. Why are Pai and his family traveling such an indirect route? They are trading their animals, right? To build up their cash reserves for Canada. So that's why they were doing that, so that they can be able, by the time they reach Canada, they could have had the cash in hand. So they were trading the animals on the way. Uh, along the route so that they could have much cash for when they reach Canada. How is Pi's childlike innocence revealed in paragraph two? Thrilling. All right, let's go to paragraph two there and see how he, from chapter 38, he says, I bought a map of the world for the trip. I had set it up in our cabin against the cock billboard. Every morning I got our position from the control bridge and marked it on the map with an orange tipped pin. We saw from Madras across the Bay of Bengal, down through the Strait of Malacca, around Singapore, and up to Manila. I loved every minute of it. It was a thrill to be on the ship. This is what we're taking. That's what shows its feelings. It was a thrill to be on the ship. This one. We're going to discuss that now. All right. It says, childlike innocence. Yes. Um, he's, he's captivated uh, by the new details of their locations. Remember, he goes to the bridge and gets points and marks them on his, um, on his map. So he's thrilled about uh, the journey. 
and he does not pay any attention at all to any potential dangers. Only the positives are dominating for him. The negatives and the possible dangers are not on his mind, and therefore he ignores them completely. So he only paid attention to the exciting parts of the, of the journey. 9.5. In the context of the novel, as a whole, discuss the tone conveyed in lives. 17 to 20. Let's go to line 17 to 20. A mountain collapsed. No, we left Manila and entered the Pacific. On our fourth day out midway to midway, we sank. The ship vanished into a pinprick hole on my map. A mountain collapsed before my eyes and disappeared beneath my feet. All around me was the vomit of a diaspetic ship. All right. Um, we even, oh my gosh, what did we do? All right, so let's go back to the last lines. And then it says, I felt sick to my stomach. I felt shocked. I felt great emptiness within me, which then filled silence. All right. It says, what does the image out of paragraph four reveal about Pai's reaction to the sinking of the ship? Um, I believe there is a disbelief of the strong ship sinking, mountain collapsed, which shows that uh, his faith in the ship is proven wrong now. That was childish and uh, innocent, innocent of him to believe that the ship is uh, cannot sink and can never be uh, harmed because he believes it's strong. So those are some of the things that you can touch on. Um, so therefore, it, it, it is fear. He's hurt uh, for days afterwards. That's what we're also going to talk about to say um, loss, the loss that he experiences, yet he was never focusing on the possibilities of a shipwreck is what we are touching on. Let's go to extract D. All right. From chapter 94, briefly explain how Pi came to wash up on the shores of Mexico. Remember, he makes a choice to leave the floating island so as to find some human contact or society. And he even vows to die trying that to find uh, humans. He was, he was washed afloat a, a uh, to Mexico because he was aboard of a lifeboat. He was flung aboard a a life point, and therefore that's what happens, uh, why he ends up being in the shores of Mexico. How does the diction employed by Pi in paragraph one reveal about the contradictory role played by Richard Parker in Pi's life? Parker, for that precise moment, he jumped over me. He, I saw his body so immeasurably vital, sketched in the air above me, a fleeting furred rainbow. He landed in the water, his back's, back legs played, he still high, and from there in a few hops, he reached the beach. He went to the left, his paws gouging the wet sand, but changed his mind and spun around. He passed directly in front of me on his way to the right. He didn't look at me. He ran a hundred yards or so along the shore before turning in. His gait was clumsy and uncoordinated. He fell several times. At the edge of the jungle, he stopped. I was certain he would turn my way. He would look at me. He would flatten his ears. He would growl. In some such way, he would conclude our relationship. He did nothing of the sort. He only looked fixedly into the jungle. Uh, then Richard Parker, companion of my torment, awful, uh, fierce thing that kept me alive, moved forward and disappeared forever from my life. It said, Reveal the contradictory role played by Richard Parker in Pi's life. Um, I believe he 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 praises Richard Parker. 
he he has admiration for Richard Parker. Uh, and remember, he, Richard Parker is a symbol of survival for him and death and life at the same time. So Richard Parker is no longer a pet, but he's a companion. But he, he is he's a he is a threat that has kept Pi alive. But Richard Parker leaves Pi without any acknowledgement of their relationship, which devastates Pi because Pi acknowledges their relationship and the role that uh, 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 Richard Parker played in his life uh, in the world. So that's what we mean. Explain Pi's relationship with God. I struggled to show and fell upon the sand. I looked about. I was truly alone, often not only or out of my family, but now of Richard Parker and me early. I thought, oh God, of course I wasn't. This bitch so soft, firm and fast was like the cheek of God. In some way, two eyes were glittering with pleasure and a mouth was smiling at having me there. All right. His relationship with God is presented in... Um, Therefore, uh, I believe he has been, he feels there's been an intervention. He feels God has been smiling upon his arrival in Mexico. The faith, his faith uh, or his relationship with God is what has given him hope. Therefore, he believes he has been saved through an intervention from God. So that's what we mean by his relationship. It's two marks. I think I've given more marks than two. Discuss why Pi believes he is now truly orphaned in paragraph two. Um, when the ship sank, he was still he was literally an orphan. He lost all members of his family. He lost everything that will even remind him of his family. But now when he becomes an orphan, he transfers his feelings and affection to Richard Parker as someone that he could share things with and care for. So when Richard Parker leaves, Pi is left without anyone. And that's why he now feels the part of being orphaned a second time. So that's why he now is now truly orphaned because Parker has even left him as well, just as his family left him. Pi refers to his rescuers as his own species. With reference to the novel as a whole, comment on how this reflects Pi's changed perception of himself while aboard the lifeboat. Um, Pi had to survive on the lifeboat. He has sacrificed himself, his values, in order to survive. He has killed, eaten meat, and compromised his faith. So as such, he has become an animal. He has changed and is functioning on the level of an animal. So he does not see anything other than a member of the animal kingdom. Um, that's what he has also become, an, a, a member of the animal kingdom because of what he has been subjected to by being abandoned on the on the boat. That's our life of Pi. All right, let's go to section C, where we have Hamlet, William Shakespeare, and then we have uh, Othello, um, and then we have the Crucible. Uh, unfortunately, I'll only touch on Hamlet, as that's the one I have studied and taught before. I have not taught Othello, so um, I will only touch on Hamlet and the Crucible for this one. All right, my apologies to our learners who are doing Othello. Hamlet, all right, let's go to the easy question. I have taught this one before, so I'm able to discuss here. Critically discuss to what, to what extent action in action can result in, certain, in certain certainty on, on, or uncertainty in the play Hamlet. All right, your response should take the form of a well-constructed essay of 400 to 450 words, two to two and a half pages. So this is a theme, remember? This becomes a theme. We all know this by now. This is a theme. This is a theme question. 
because it's certainty versus uncertainty. Yeah, that's a theme. Definitely. We are looking at the theme of certainty versus uncertainty. Um, what we are going to talk about is um, Hamlet is seeking revenge for his father's ghost. We, we expect him to get the revenge, but when he is about to get revenge, there's postponing happening and delaying happening and doubting happening so many times because it's almost like he wants to be educated about it and intelligent about it. He wants to gain more knowledge and be more certain about what is happening before he can act. So the hesitation is what we're talking about before any act is done of revenge. And also, uh, then we now come to the point where uh, procrastination now comes in. When we say uncertainty, the discussion of procrastination will come in because there are so many times that he is indecisive about what he wants to do. And therefore, this makes him not act at all. And therefore, it becomes uncertainty. He questions a lot of things. Um, for example, is the ghost what it appears to be? Or is it just misleading him? Uh, does the ghost have reliable knowledge? Or is the ghost itself delusional? Uh, can he get a confession from Claudius before he can, you know, he's so, he's so, de he's delaying the whole process. Uh, and also the issue of, uh, is it really crazy? Uh, he, when it comes to um, the feigning of madness. So there are so many things that we, we are talking about when it comes to certainty and uncertainty. Um, he can never be sure of anything. That's why he cannot take action. I believe that uh, he delays when even he, when he, even he gets the evidence from the play within the play or finds Claudius playing in the Pay, praying in the garden, but he still does not take any revenge. When he does act, he's reckless, violent, he does it blindly, and therefore we, 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 we need to discuss all these elements and these instances of Hamlet not doing the right thing when he could have, not getting the revenge when he had so many opportunities and chances, and therefore that's what we mean when we say Certainty versus uncertainty. Certainty is when he gets the evidence. Play within the play. Claudius play, praying in the garden. The mother, but still he does not do anything. So this is a clear a, a, a theme. Claudius becomes the king, marries the queen. His conscience torments him. Uh, but we realize that when he prays in the garden, still... Hamlet doesn't do anything. Uh, we also can bring in Laetus as well into the discussion. He wants his revenge, but he's easily influenced and manipulated by Claudius and what Claudius wants. And therefore, that's where the poisoned to jewel now happens. And unfortunately, it turns back upon himself as well. So that's what you could have discussed there, which is trying to uh, find ideas, which is a good one, because it is, there's a lot of procrastination, I think we realize. Let's go to the context as well. Refer to lines three to six. So then, I would not have your enemy say so, nor shall you do mine ear the violence to make it trust of your own report against yourself. I know you are not, you are no true when. All right, what was the question? The question said, what is Horatio's reasoning, reason for coming to see Hamlet other than the funeral of King Hamlet? And how does this impact the play as a whole? Um, for coming to see Hamlet, other than the, it's a it's a Gertrude marriage between Gertrude and Claudius, months after King Hamlet's death. So uh, Horatio came back for Gertrude's wedding 
but not for the King Hamlet's funeral, uh, which now is clearly stating implications are the wedding took place immediately after the funeral without observing the traditional mourning period that is supposed to surpass. Refer to nine, to line to 11. My Lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pity thee, do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Okay. Account for Hamlet's response in these lines. Um, this is, um, um, I believe this is immediately uh, after his encounter with the ghost. And therefore, Horatio now wants to inform Hamlet of what happened. So, Horatio sharing the knowledge of the ghost with Hamlet uh, is what makes him aware of the death of his father and how he came to die, that he was killed and did not die of natural causes. So it could have impacted the play differently because uh, it could have spared a lot of lives, innocent lives that were lost. It could have also spared his own life as well as he ended up dying as well in the end due to the irrational, volatile acting that he did in the name of revenge. So that's what we could give in there. Um, discuss the dramatic iron of Hamlet's words in this line. I shall not look upon his like again. Okay. Uh, he'll never see his deceased father again. But we are aware that uh, King Hamlet's ghost has been seen. Hamlet will see the ghost, therefore his assumption is wrong. Because when he talks about he'll never see his deceased father, shortly after he sees the ghost, and therefore he does see him. Um, critically discuss the role that the ghost play, plays in Hamlet. Um, it's the one that sets the play in motion. Because it's the true nature of Claudius's death, Oh, the true nature of that Claudius met as, met as the king is coming from the ghost. The, the ghost appears when Hamlet is with Gertrude to remind Hamlet that it is Claudius that he must murder. So as a result, it's the one that sets the plan of vengeance into motion and leads to the death of the main characters as well. So it's the one that sets the whole play in motion and the whole plot is hinged on its contents of what it said about its own death. Okay, the next one, let's go to extract F. Extract F says, account for Claudius's lie in line two. She soon to see them bleed. Account for Claudius's lie in line two. She soon to see them bleed. Okay, we we go on to question um eleven point five, which says account for Claudius's lie in line two, she soon to see them bleed. Uh okay, uh Gertrude collapses after uh, drinking the poison. Um the poison drink, yes. She collapses after she drinks the poison drink that Claudius intended to uh, kill Hamlet with. So Claudius now lies to prevent the truth about his plot to murder Hamlet uh, from being revealed, possibly also to conceal that he possibly met that King Hamlet. Uh, he does not want to give up the kingship 
He's a new king. He doesn't want to let it go. So he's trying to conceal the truth and lie in an effort that it is not discovered. Comment on the significance of Gertrude's calling for Hamlet as she dies. No, no, I am poisoned. Um, Gertrude realizes, uh, um, let's go to line three. I need the other lines there. Line three, three, there is. No, no, the drink, the drink, oh my dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink, I am poisoned. Okay. Uh, it says on the significance, which is the importance of Gertrude's calling for Hamlet as she dies. Um, she realizes that Claudius is guilty of King Hamlet's murder and realizes that Claudius intended to kill Hamlet as well. But she also realizes that she has neglected her own son and therefore might have been an accomplice in Claudius's plan to murder Hamlet as she has been quiet. She calls out for Hamlet uh, as a way of um, announcing her mistakes, acknowledging her mistakes, marrying Claudius being loyal to Claudius at the cost of her son, and therefore it becomes a warning to um, to Hamlet before she dies. Um, if you were the director of the production of Hamlet, uh, how would you instruct the actor to deliver these lines? Pay special attention to body language and tone. Justify your answer. Uh, Seventeen to nineteen. Here, thou incestuous matter as damned Dane. Drink off this portion. Is thy union here? Follow my mother. Okay. Um, I believe we can we can talk about uh it says uh instructed to deliver these lines, body language, tone, forceful. Yes, because he is forcing Claudius to consume the poison tree, so it's forceful. Angry tone, yes, angry tone, uh, 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 laced with uh, pain. Those are the things that you can talk about. One arm holding down Claudius, while the other hand forces Claudius to drink. So those are the things that you can uh, bring in there. But you have to give a, a, an election of a scenario, how it can be delivered and how it can be done. So those are the things that are coming up there as well. All right, we go on to the next one. It says there is a distinct difference in the vengeance Hamlet gets at the end of the play compared to that of, of what he brought. Critically discuss the extent to which you agree with the statements. There is a difference, he says. Um, Hamlet gets his revenge or his vengeance because he gets clarity regarding whether killing Claudius is justified. Um, although the difference is that he, he, he loses his own life, but uh, there are a lot of inno innocent lives or characters that are also uh, lost on the way. But when it comes to 14 brass, he does reclaim the throne of Denmark. There is no loss of life, innocent lives, there is no compromising of morals. There is no uncertainty. Uh, his vengeance is planned but done at the right time. Whereas Hamlet's vengeance is planned but unfortunately things do not go well and he does not have the right time to exact it. So those are the possible things that you can discuss there in the difference of their vengeance. All right, we're going to go to our final question, which is the crucible. That's the one I'm currently teaching as well right now, and therefore we'll touch on it. Um, the Society of Salem relies upon strong leadership to prevent it falling into chaos, it says. When the, this leadership fails, the tragedy of the play occurs. Okay. Um, in an essay of 400 to 450 words, critically discuss the validity of the statement. The society of Salem relies upon strong leadership. We're definitely going to strong leadership without faith. Mm, yes. 
prevent it falling into chaos. When leadership fails, tragedy occurs. All right. Let's talk about the Salem society as well, because it is there. When it comes to the society of Salem, I believe we're talking about okay, um just a bit of space, yeah. When we're talking about the society of Salem, I believe we are touching on religious, conservative society, very conservative, conservative society, um, religious principles comes in as well there. Moral principles also taken into consideration by the society. Um, and as such, when we say the society of Salem, we're talking about a very secluded, exclusive, religiously conservative family. And as such, they are now, uh, their lives are founded and based upon religious and moral principles. And then when we come in, we realize that as evidence of that, all the members of the society um, sign a, a covenant when they reach adulthood in order to be recognized as full members of the society, of the community. And the covenant touches on um, religious beliefs, the basis of their religious beliefs, and the priest in the position of the leader of the community. So which means there is someone who will guide them, who will lead them, and that is the priest. Um, one of the things that always come in when we're talking about uh, strong leadership now is uh, a strong leader is the one whose authority is strong. He's backed up by religious tradition. Uh, and as such, leads them to the right path. So when we begin, Salem is a successful religious farming community. Uh, and as such, um, we, we, we have that gap of saying they are trading with the outside world. So they, 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 as much as they're exclusively religious and conservative, they are a farming community that is trading with the, the other colonies around them. And uh, that's where we realize that the Salem co community uh, unfortunately has uh, a wealth gap in it. They have a wealth gap in it and therefore that creates a problem for them. Um, when we say prevent it falling into chaos, uh, we're going to come back to that later on, but um, we we there are things that we should talk about whereby we say the tragedy that occurs from the Salem community being exclusive and religiously conservative is the uh, is the girls, the girls, the girls' curiosity is piqued to an extent that they experiment on what they've been denied to experiment on for reasons that um, they are not allowed to dance, they are not allowed to go to certain boundaries, but they find themselves in the forest dancing because of their curiosity of why they are not allowed to do such things. And that's where the first tragedy hits now to say when the girls experiment, they bring chaos to society is now uh, it builds into a whole lot of intricate uh, uh, personal conflicts and vengeances. Um, there is so much squabbling that happens now due to the girls' issue because uh, when we come to the feuds, uh, we're now talking about uh, personal vendettas uh, when we talk of the put names, proctors, because uh, the, 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 the put names feel um, 
superior and therefore it is a problem because uh, the feeding now leads into a cycle of um, suspicions and therefore public reputations must be maintained at the cost of someone coming down and being revenged on for something which happened centuries ago, which was not known. So which means their personal vendettas are now made into the playing ground uh, on the assumption of uh, the court trials. And that's where the chaos really erupts now. Uh, I believe one of the things we should talk about is that uh, Reverend Paris, uh calls for Reverend Hale to come and uh make some sense into the witchcraft uh, issues. Uh and as such that is now Reverend Paris taking control and taking charge of a situation as a strong leader and saying that uh we need to know whether this is true or not or if it is existing or not. So uh, that's someone that we can talk about. But we also realize Reverend Hale is a strong leader as well because he's an expert in his field of uh, witchcraft. But now he also causes further chaos because when he discovers that there is no witchcraft, he keeps quiet and unfortunately does not take a stand because of uh, fearing that he will lose his reputation and authority and he will not be respected anymore. Um, even Danforth is a strong leader, very decisive, but uh, his priorities are not really in tune with the needs of the people in Salem. And that's where now the problem lies because it's now more about him than about uh, the people of Salem. And that's exactly what Hale does as well. Both Hale and Danforth are similar in the sense that they are very strong, decisive leaders, but their priorities are misplaced because they now have to think they have to sacrifice the whole lot at the expense of themselves. Um, I believe Giles Corey is also going to come in because he's very concerned with being right in the eyes of the law. Uh, which leads to his death eventually. He attempts to collaborate with the witch trials, but now leads to his wife being arrested and his death ultimately. John Proctor is a victim of his guilty conscience because of the affair with Abigail Williams. He believes the others are more worthy than him, and so they should take the lead in stopping the trials. But also we discover he believes that the common sense of the community must uh, 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 what is this must prevail for him he is very reluctant to damage his own reputation for his own sake or for that of his children as well but finally uh, the strain between him and his wife uh, causes him to hesitate uh, and therefore he has to now uh, ultimately do the right thing for his wife uh we 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 discover that when we come to um the tragedy is the innocent lives being lost which was unnecessary at all costs but they it still happened and as such it, it was it was really it, it was really a, a challenging for um the leadership to maintain itself is the leaders had to now put themselves first, but at the cost of everyone. So that's what we, we, we must be bringing in when talking about when leadership fails. The leadership failed Salem, but Salem also failed some of their leaders as well. I think that's what we will be discussing there. All right, let's go to the context. The context is um, from Extract I is from, okay, Act 2. Account for Hale urging Proctor to testify in court. Hale believes that the court is upright, will be just, and is in a court of integrity. So when he 
calls upon Proctor to testify, it's because he's banking on Proctor being a reliable witness in finding the truth behind the accusations. He is the one who signed the warrants, remember? So his reputation is on the line if those arrests are innocent. So now Proctor as being a, a, a reputable person is likely to be the one to uh, testify. Uh, refer to line six to nine, I falter nothing, I am no fool. Comment on one protest tone reveals about him in this context. Let's go to 9629. I falter nothing, but I may wonder if my story will be credited in such a court. I do wonder on it when such a steady minded minister as you will do suspicion, such as a woman that never lies and cannot, and the world knows she cannot. I may falter somewhat, mister. I am no fool. Okay. Okay. Let's go and see the question again. It says, uh, comment on what Proctor's tone reveals about him in this context. He's confident. He is very confident. He, he is really believing that uh, uh, he believes the truth. He is protective of his wife. And therefore, that shows in the confidence in, in his tone that his wife uh, is innocent and has done nothing wrong. So he is very confident, even passionate about it, very protective of, of his wife, and that's clear. 15.31, what does Proctor mean when he says that Elizabeth bewilders Hale? Um, Elizabeth has said she, she does not believe in witches. But now Hale has come to the Proctor's residents to establish the Christian character of their home and Elizabeth has claimed to not believe in witchcraft uh, which is acknowledged in the Bible actually so as a result uh, Hale is bewildered because uh, she she can, she said she does not believe in any witchcraft of any sort uh, discuss uh, it says uh, what does Proctor's yeah. admonishment say about his relationship with Elizabeth? He's very protective, overprotective. He wants her to say the right things so that she will not be blamed, she will not be harmed, and will not be found guilty, definitely. Discuss Elizabeth's uncharacteristic confidence and strength shown in lines 24 to 26. Let's go to line 24 to 26 quickly. Um... I cannot think the devil may own a woman's soul, Mr. Hale, when she keeps an upright way as I have. I am a good woman. I know it, and if you believe I may do only good work in the world and yet be secretly bound to Satan, then I must tell you, say, I do not believe it. Okay, uh, it says confidence and unchar uncharacteristic confidence and strength. Um, she speaks strongly about her innocence, which makes it clear that she's not involved in witchcraft. And uh, she's deeply religious. She's devoted. So those are the things that come in there. So she, she is innocent, that she's not involved in any part of the witchcraft. She's very religious. She's a very devoted woman and is confident in her innocence. 15.5, comment on Elizabeth's tone in line 32. Question Abigail. Okay, let's go to line 32. Question Abigail Williams about the gospel, not myself. Okay, our question say comment on Elizabeth's tone. Very angry. Judgmental, disapproving. Her upright ways and reputation are a testimony of her beliefs in the Bible and its gospel. But however, she, in this line, she's very critical of Abigail's intentions uh, because she knows, Elizabeth knows Abigail is not innocent. Abigail is not as righteous as she's pretending to be. And therefore it is, that's why she will question Abigail about the gospel than Elizabeth. Uh, all right, let's go to extract J and finish our play. It says, uh, discuss Proctor's conflicting feelings about the confession. Okay. Um, Proctor 
assumed he will be able to manipulate the situation and benefit from it to become for his advantage. He makes a confession out of what we call it self-interest, I believe. He will confess if it means say, saving his own life and his soul, but not if it means sacrificing his good name and reputation. So by making a false confession, he will save himself and be able to take care of his family. So he is exploiting the law uh, of those who confess to witchcraft. However, to actually have the confession in writing, for all of Salem to see it is too much for him to bear. He does not want his confession to be recorded at all. So that's the conflict that we are having. He does want to confess, but he still does not want the confession to be recorded as a, a future reference. Explain the irony of Danforth's words, I will not deal in lies, mister. Um, Danforth is insisting that Proctor's confession should not be a lie, should not be fabricated. Yet, the whole trial is based on lies. And Danforth has been accepting the lies from the others and therefore, the whole trials are based on lies. He has been dealing with lies from the beginning. So that's the irony that we mean to say, he cannot say he will not deal with lies, yet he has been taking lies from the beginning of the, of the witch trials. Refer to line 17. If you are the director of the play, hysterically, as though the tearing paper were his life, how would you instruct the actor to deliver these lines? Motivated instructions with reference to both body language and tone. Okay. Um, grabbing Proctor is one of them. Uh, putting his head in between his hands. Uh, panicking voice filled with panic because uh, it, it, it's it's a clear sign of panic. So whatever the hands will do must be a sign of panicking. Whatever the, however the voice will come out must be in a panicking voice as well. Okay, if in Proctor's outcry, um, he emphasizes that he only has his name. Using this extract as a starting point, critically comment on the importance of name and reputation in asylum. Okay. Um, name and reputation um I, th I think we see from proctor his reputation is so important to him that's what makes him um but now it's also an indication of his integrity and his character he does not disclose his adultery at first because he does not want his reputation ruined but now he is standing for what is true so he can only live up to his name and therefore his reputation as well. When he's going to be executed, he will lose his life, but the integrity of his name will remain intact as the confession will not be recorded. So as such, I, I believe the importance of name and reputation in Salem is seen through Proctor. I believe this is where we bring it in to say how he starts off very prideful and does not want anything known about his affair but ultimately ends up saying you will confess and give up his reputation. Um, so that's what we are dealing with when it comes to the crucible. Please prepare properly for that paper too. This is your revenge paper. You must be able to go gain as much marks as possible and then go seal it properly in paper three. Uh, thank you for your time and good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon, Chapter 12. This session is going to be a revision in preparation for the 2. Just had to find something that um, will assist you in internalizing the poems in an organized way. I took the poems that have been proven a little bit complicated for my own learners and the um, number of learners that I interact with on the outside sphere. So I'm going, going to touch on, uh, it is a fictitious evening commentary. The morning sun is shining, it's a funeral and the ship wreck. 
Okay, so those are the ones I will talk about today. So I'm going to try and um, make a revision um, example of um, how you can internalize your poetry. And then we align ourselves to the examination and look at the uh, typical exam questions that can come in. So that's what we are going to focus on. All right, let's go to um, our question paper and try and see if it can make sense of this for the means to be. All right, our paper, remember, is two and a half hours. And as a result, we have to align ourselves to choosing at least two questions, um, any two of the prescribed poetry, and try and get through the 20 marks and then go to your answering point, which is the compulsory question. For you to get through the 30 months. Okay. Without wasting any time, I want to revise poetry. I want to explain things so that it can be easier for you to digest and internalize. All right. This is one of our structure poems. It's a sonnet. So definitely, this is something we are looking forward to learn and understanding so that they can be able to look at the type of questions that fall under a sonnet. All right, it is a beautious evening, calm and free is by William Wordsworth. It is a beautious evening, calm and free. The holy time is quiet as a nun. Breathless with adoration, the broad sun is sinking down in its tranquility. The gentleness of heaven is on the sea. Listen, the mighty being is awake and doth with his eternal motion make a sound like thunder everlastingly. Dear child, dear girl, that walkest with me here. If thou appear untouched by solemn thoughts, thy nature is not therefore less designed. Divine, thou liest in Abraham's bosom all the year and worshipest at the temple's inner shrine. God be with thee when we know it. All right, it came in as an easy question in this paper that I'm using today. But before we can go to the easy part, let's just go and uh, look at the poem in general and see what we can do. It is a Petrican sonnet. We call it an Italian sonnet, definitely. So when we say it's an Italian sonnet, we are trying to bring uh, the issue across that an Italian sonnet, sonnet is fixed. It has a fixed structure. So we must be able to focus on uh, touching on what we mean by an Italian sonnet, right? When we say it's an Italian sonnet, we're talking about a 14-line poem. When we say it's a 14-line poem, we're talking of the first eight lines of the poem. That's nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right. We divide our poem into two parts. So it's eight lines, that's part one, and then it's line nine, 14 is part two. Uh, we call line, um, one to eight, my apologies, one to eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yes. Line one to eight, right, line one to eight, we call line one to eight an octave. So, and then we call line 9 to 14 as a first hit. So our Italian sonnet is, is divided into two parts. We have an octave and then we have a first hit. So this automatically divides the content of the poem. So our poem is already divided in content into two parts in an Italian sonnet. So as such, when we are coming in, when we're dealing with line one to eight, when we say it's a beautious evening, it's calm and free, there's adoration, there's a broad sun, we have the heavens, the seas, the mighty being, uh, thunder. Line one to eight describes the beauty of the scene. So we are saying our octave touches on the beauty of nature. So we are coming in and saying, when we start the sonnet, we have beauty of nature being described 
breathtaking a word that we're going to use breathtaking beauty of the scene that is looking at the nature scene but when we come to the last six lines it shifts now uh, because it's no longer now describing the beauty of the nature or the breathtaking uh, a beautiful scenery instead it shifts to the spirituality part so our content is divided into two parts because in line one to eight he talks about how peaceful and tranquil the nature scene is and therefore we also talk about the nun the comparison is made to a nun that is quiet as she is in prayer they're being very close to God. She loves God so much. And therefore, line three, when she talks about breathless, um, emphasizes the silence. So when we say adoration, breathless with adoration, it emphasizes the silence. Just as the nun is breathless with adoration, he says, so does the feeling of this time and place that takes away his breath. He is in awe of the beauty of God's creation. But now he comes in and he links the beauty of nature to God. When he brings in now um, the mighty being being awake. So he links the sea to God and creates a connection. He talks about the, 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 the sun. So when he talks about the, the, the sun, um, the broad sun, we are looking at the amazing creation uh, by God. It becomes a large orange ball, the colors of sunset stretching out across the horizon. That's a description of the beauty that we are talking about. So we are talking about heaven seems to be watching over the sea below. That's why we're saying of the connection between the sea and God. So as such, we are saying God is watching over the world. But then now he comes in and gives a command in line, um, which line is this one? Line six, when he says, listen. So now when he says, listen, it indicates his excitement. And it's a, it, 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 there's an exclamation mark there to show the intensity of the command. So as such, we are coming in and he says, um, he is bringing us now into the scenery as the participants. And then he says, the mighty being, which is literally the sea, because literally is talking about the sea, but figuratively it's a connection to God. So now we are coming in and saying that um, the capital letter in the B of being, although the speaker is referring to the sea, the capital letter links the sea to God, who is the almighty being. So both the sea and God are awake, and I believe we also say eternal motion in the next line. When he talks about they neither stop moving. So now we are coming in and talking about the breaking waves. They sound like thunder everlastingly. They sound like thunder are the waves. So when he comes and brings in the waves, he's talking about um, they indicate the power of nature and the power of God. So we have a, a, a a literal and figurative meaning here. So as such, that's what we should always take note of. But now those eight lines are focusing on the breathtaking beauty of nature, the beautiful description of nature and the scene. So those are the eight lines that begin the poem. And now when we shift and move on now to um, line nine yes we move on to line nine i believe when we come into line nine we have a shift in content now when you say we have a shift shift in content we are now talking about a new direction in content coming in so now we are going to talk about um dear child dear girl starting off the suspect the speaker now is talking about his love and adoration for his own daughter. Even if she, is, she might be too young to understand the beauty of nature or be moved 
of the in awe of the beauty of nature because she's still so young. He still says it does not mean that she is removed from God or is less spiritual. So he understands nature above from an adult point of view because he's mature. And that's why he's able to now be in awe and adoration and breathtakingly describe it. But now she is so young, and therefore he brings in to say she is still so young, but is still under God's protection. That's why he brings in in Abraham's bosom, which is the metaphor uh, in line 11, because he refers to heaven, whereby like a father holds a baby to protect it. His girl child is unknowingly protected by God, and therefore God is always present to protect her. So now he also talks about uh, and worship has at the temples in a shrine. That's a reference to nature again. If she does not express her devotion, if she does not go to a place of worship, uh, like a church, which is the temple and the shrine that is referring to, God is always present in nature. So she doesn't need to go to a, a place of worship to experience God's love because God is present in nature and is seen in nature. So now he's also to emphasizing God's presence there. God is present. God is even with the child, even if she's not aware of it. That's why we talk about the spirituality part, whereby the connection is valid. The connection is existing, even though the child is not aware or oblivious that the connection is there. So the connection that the child needs to see does not need her to be mature to see God's uh, 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 gentleness in the sea of God's uh, uh, existence in the broad sun. But the connection is in the child being uh, uh, protected without its knowledge because of its young age and tender age. But the spirituality part is the connection is existing. Those are the two parts that make up this poem, uh, which is our Italian sonnet. That's why we have to break it down a little so that we come and bring in a memory of what we're dealing with when coming to the British evening, calm and free. The words calm and free are very expressive. Those are what we call teaching words, because we're talking about peace. We're talking about tranquility. We're talking about uh, 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 calmness. So as such, this is what we're talking about. No worries, no stress. It's tranquil, it's peaceful. So that's what we mean when we're talking about calm, and free. So now when we're coming into this poem, we're going to do an easy question to try and figure out exactly how we can structure our content based on an easy question. All right, it says with cross-reference to diction, structure, and tone, discuss how the poet argues with the div that the divine is present in nature, even if people are not aware of this. Remember, an easy question is always based on uh, um, what is highlighted. So we are focusing on these three things. Okay? Is our diction, two is our structure, and three is our tone. So our question is going to revolve around the content or the elements that are based on only diction, structure, and tone. But now what are we supposed to do with these three? We are only taking what is relevant to touch on that the divine is present in nature. So when we say divine, we're talking of God, right? That means God is present in nature, in it, even if people are not aware of this. So we're only going to take the things that are answering that question and not anything else. Okay, let's begin. All right. Among others, this is just a guide to say, depending on your understanding of the poem, what is relevant for you? I believe one of the things that we we um going to talk about is that God is present in nature. I think that's the first thing. In nature. That we look at on a daily basis. Uh, 
but we are not conscious. What do we mean by this? When you say we are not conscious of this, we are talking about, uh, I believe when he says, uh, I'm God being with thee when we know it not. So as such, that's the unaware part. I believe this line shows the unaware part. But when we're talking about God's presence, we are going to touch on adoration, God's son. I think God's son that we look at every day from the morning that it rises until it sets down. So we are looking at the broad sun, but we still do not realize the greatness of God in creating it and being there. So those are the things that we're talking about when we say, in general, the poem is making a statement that God is there in nature, but we do not know it. We are unaware of it. That's why we are bringing in the issue of um, uh, we are talking about the, the, the nature, the breathtaking scene that is in front of us, but we are not focusing on it. And that's why now it becomes difficult for us to uh, 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 appreciate it because we take it for granted. We are looking at it, we are having it, but we are not doing anything about it. We are unaware of it and we take it for granted. We are un unconscious about it. So that's what we mean uh, when we are talking about uh, unaware. That's our starting point. All right, let's continue and now get to the basics, which is the fiction, the structure, and the tone. I think I will talk about the structure first because it is, that's the easiest for a learner uh, to start with. Let's start with structure and see what we are going to place there and the structure. All right. When we are coming to the structure, we are going to talk about um, the three parts of the poem. We cannot leave them out. We are going to talk about the, the octave, we are going to talk about the sestet. We cannot leave them out. What are we saying now? We are saying that um, it is an Italian sonnet that has a, a, a an octave and a sestet. So in the octave, we have to specify what does it do? Uh, physical description is given. Okay, the physical description of nature is given. Of sunset, I believe I've used sunset. Gentleness of heaven. So that's what we are talking about. Uh, but now it, it will also now um, move to the sister, whereby he is going to um, bring connection to the child. Connection to the child who is unaware. God's divinity. And yet the child he is looking at God when looking at nature. All right. So we're bringing in a point on the structure to say our structure does give us the implication of uh, um, God being divine, present in nature, as we talked about the physical description, this one, the physical description of nature, that way we see God. But now people not aware we're going to use the child, whereby the child is unaware of God's divinity because of its young age. Yes, the child is looking at God every day when looking at nature, but is unaware of God's divinity and presence in, in her life. So now that's what we're talking about today. God's divinity is in nature that the child looks at, but the child is not aware. So that's something that we can bring in in talking of the structure as an example of the point 
of all the building structure when we are coming in. Um, but still, that does not make, I think we need to make a clarity, does not make uh, does not make uh, God's divinity less important. It does not make his divinity less important at all uh, or, or less divine. But um, it does not make God's connection less divine. So we are trying to make a point to say, um, safe in the bosom of Abraham, whereby we have access to God in places of uh, uh, um, worship, the temple, the shrine. Yet still, you do not need to go to the shrine. So another point that can come in under structure is the issue of God's presence. is usually associated to temples, places of worship, yet the same God is present or is God is always present in nature. I think that's another sign whereby we are talking about uh, nature described in the octave. So we are bringing in the structure in, the structure only deals with the part of the poem. So that's why we'll be very specific when touching on the point that we are only dealing with the structure at a certain time. We move on. Remember, we're just discussing some things. And then we move on now and talk on um, the diction. I believe diction is a lot to say. Definitely, our diction is loaded. Diction is when we have to extract certain words, phrases that evoke uh, uh, in us a response so as such we are now talking about the diction that is going to bring about the beauty of nature at the same time it's also going to bring in the connection uh, to spirituality and divinity I believe you teachers is coming in what's the up and see which words we can deal with I believe we can touch on the teachers definitely there's no way we'll leave this one out. When we say it is a beautiful evening, we cannot leave it out because that word has connotations of our, uh, when we're coming in, calm and free. Beautiful evening, calm and free, right? Yes. Calm, free. That's nature. So as such, when we're talking about beautiful, calm, free, these are now connected to the holy time. So we, we are having nature, we are having divinity following. So as such, that's why we, we are going to touch on uh, uh, these ones and, and talk about them in unison because we cannot leave them out. Um, all right. Let, let's go and take a minute and we'll see what we see, uh, what we say about them and we'll connect them. So we are taking, we are saying when the quietness is compared to a holy time, that's where we make a connection to nature. So let's go and see what how we can phrase this one. The evening is called beautiful, linked with calmness and freeness. 
So we are quoting the number. So these are now uh, 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 compared to a holy time, which is when one is in a religious uh, uh, um, set up, silent adoration to God. So as a result, he's actually bringing in the fact that nature encourages us to be aware of God as if we are in a religious set up and are praying to God like a man is doing. So that's why we are getting that connection to say when we are looking at nature in a calm and free mode, at the beautiful nature that he called it, it's not different from when we are in a church or in a religious set up and we are having our quiet time of prayer just as a man is doing. So that's why now we are coming in and saying, therefore, we are unaware of that uh, 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 divinity because when we're looking at nature, we do not take it as a prayer time. We only take it as an appreciation time. But that quiet appreciation time is now equivalent to a nun who is praying with adoration to God. So that's why we are we are taking those words because we are uh, 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 making a connection between divinity and nature uh, and making sure that we find the connection. Let's continue. We also have, um, which words can it? Tranquility. Yes, this one. Tranquility is definitely coming in. We are going to take that word. So tranquility is linked to also calm. Sinking down in its tranquility, that is element of being calm. Definitely. So we are going to take tranquility, I believe, and we are going to talk about uh, nature is a reflection of heaven. It's a reflection of God's divinity. So now when we say in tranquility, gentleness, the gentleness of heaven, so when we take these two words, we're going to take tranquility. The gentleness of heaven is in its sea, is on the sea. We are now connecting and saying that uh, there's a link, a reflection of heaven, the divine. And therefore, we, we, we also have other words that we can take. I believe we can also take uh, the sound, thunder. A sound like thunder, everlastingly, this one, everlastingly. I think that's also something which can come in there. When we say everlastingly, it talked about eternal motion. Right. Right. When we say eternal motion, which is of the waves, they are now also, the thunder is also given everlastingly. When we say eternal, that's us talking about God's eternity. So there is already nature here. When we are listening to the waves, it means that God's presence, which is everlasting, because we know God is divine and everlasting. But now when the thunder is given connotations of everlasting, that is linking nature now to God and saying that it is everlasting. So those are some of the words that can jump in now and we can talk about them and bring them in as our teaching uh, um, discussion. Um, what else can we take? I believe the mighty being is awake, also comes in. You can also take it because that's the direct link where he connects God to the sea. That's a connection. Connects God to the sea, definitely. That's... Um, the mighty being is awake. Mm -hmm. So that's us bringing in to say um, the mighty being is in reference to the sea, but at the same time, it is, it's in reference to God directly as the creator of the sea itself. And therefore, when we are looking at the mighty sea, we are directly looking at the creator of the sea itself. And therefore, that's the fiction that you can also connect there. All right, let's move on to one quick thing so that we can touch on all parts of the paper. 
Um, you just said to go Tara on the essay question because learners abandon it most times because they tell themselves that it is difficult. When we're coming to the tone, the tone of the poem is very calm. First five lines, it's very calm. Um, when we say it is a beautiful evening, calm and free, the holy time is quiet as a nun, breathless with adoration. The God's sun is sinking down in its tranquility. Uh, the gentleness of heaven is on the sea. We definitely have a calm tone in the first five lines of the poem. And therefore, uh, which is now our connection to uh, line 14, I believe. Yes. Which is our connection to line 14. God being with V. We definitely have a calm tone. We definitely have um, an, a, 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 a meditative tone. We definitely have a respectful tone. So any of those we're coming in when we're talking on um, the tone so that you can be able to touch on them. When we say meditative, I believe when we're talking about evening, calm and free, which is now connected to the holy time of meditation, that's what we mean when we say you make a connection of the tone. Um, and then when we're talking about the mighty being being awake, that is a tone of all. Uh, which is a connection to God as the creator as well. So that is the connection that we are talking about. So he is present even in the tone. Yeah, the divinity of God is present. So that's what we're talking about. So the tones that came in were a tone of awe, a tone of um, tranquility, peaceful, any of those were acceptable, and then um, respectful as well. The silence that we award to nature when we are observing it is compared to a, a time of prayer where uh, we are saying our prayers to God like a man. That's our easy question that we're touching on. So there are, those are elements that we could have covered. Let's go to question number two. Question number two was the morning sun is shining by only shining. The morning sun is shining on the green, green willow tree and send the golden sunbeam to dance upon my knee. The fountain bubbles merrily, the yellow locks of spring of life and light and sunshine, the happy brown bed sing. And then it says, the yellow crown trees love the wind um, with all the sweet and strong. Um, there is a hand I never touch or the face I never see. Now what is sunshine? What is song? Now what is light to me? This is a, a another nature poem as well. It's a 69 poem this time, but it has four distinct parts. We must be clear. We have line one to four, definitely, where she discusses the sense of speech. So our poem is divided into some sort of portraying of themselves. But when we come to um, line one to four, one, two, three, four, this one, this is the sense of sight. Right. When we continue to line five to eight, when we come to line five to eight, it is this hearing part. So it touches on the hearing. When we continue to line nine to twelve, um, it's a smell. It's smell. So our senses are awakened as much as possible. And then the last four lines now differ in content because uh, they do not touch on the, on the senses or anything touch. In face I never see, but now it's not only on one sense because there's a sense of touch there, there's a sense of sight there. So that one differs now because it deviates, these ones, they deviate from the pattern. So the last one line deviate from the pattern that is coming from the top of the poem itself. So there's a break in pattern when we come to the last line. All right, let's try. Um, this is a reflection of the beauty of the morning. The morning sun is shining, which means it's a dawn, the green, green willow tree. So that's touching on the beauty of nature. Repetition there of green reinforces and emphasizes the beauty of nature intensity of color, which is green of the willow tree. 
Green is a color associated with life. So we have life with freshness. Uh, we have vegetation, we have health, because a lot of connotation. The sun is also symbolic of life, actually. So as such, uh, but when we move on, the sun is personified as blessing the earth. And therefore, we continue, and it creates a very happy mood there. Sun golden, being termed golden, causes happiness, riches, wealth, beauty, are the connotations coming in. But in line five to eight now, the beauty of nature is on a level of the senses, as I said. Fountain, bubbling, even human qualities of bubbling, being joyful, which now gives us the happy mood again in cheerfulness. So now we, we are touching on nature and how it's described, but in its description, it's made alive. It's, a, it's awakened because it's personified metaphors are dominating as well. So now we, we, we have riches, wealth, beauty. So as such, we, we have this idyllic view, perfection of beauty, well-being, happy. But now when we're coming to the springs as well, vibrant, alive. So there is brown birds singing. Anamatopia is brought in in the bubbling sound. So now beauty of the surroundings, beauty of nature in the description of nature is given to us. And we also realize that now um, the happiness is in the birds as well. Nature is celebrating life itself. We, we continue, and the earth is personified as wearing beautiful clothes. Every part of the world is filled with beauty. That makes the poet happy. The trees are full of flowers. The sense of smell is brought alive. Uh, dominant smell, sweet and strong, which talks about the strength of the smell. Alliteration is even used there uh, to bring out the, the beauty of the nature and made alive. Celebration of beauty is dominating this poem through sounds, through smells, through sight, through hearing, through touch. So all the senses are awakened. And now it brings in now something different because in lines 13 to 15, it changes. The tone changes completely because now he brings in a new word and says never. And the face I never see, a, a hand I never touch. And therefore now there's a break. In, in, in the happiness that we've experienced because now there's a ton of sadness. Grief, hopelessness is now dominating because this is reflecting the loss that she has suffered through the loss of the child. For she ends the poem in a painful way because she does not see the need to experience a beautiful and natural morning if she has no one to share her with. The child is still alive to share the beauty of the morning sun with the child, but now she does not see the need to appreciate the morning sun and its and its surroundings because of what she of the loss that she has experienced. So now we're talking of elements of uh, loss because she feels despondent at the loss of a child and therefore does sees nature and its beauty as beautiful. All right, let's go to the question and see how we can get through. Um, this one. It says, number one, discuss the usage of diction in stanza one to show the vitality and beauty of nature. When we say discuss the usage of diction, uh, we have to quote something. We have to use certain words. Okay. I believe we'll take golden sunbeams. I believe these are the words that will pop up. Golden sunbeams came in. Hands upon my knee came in in stanza one. Um, fountain bubbling also comes in. Mm -hmm. It says uh, usage of diction in stanza one to show the vitality and beauty of nature. Brown bed singing, I believe that yes, there was brown bed singing there, also comes in as part of nature. So now we are talking about descriptions like this one. It's three marks, so you can discuss any two. I think we have four. Just two are relevant for you there. Celebrating um, the joy the fullness of nature and life. So that's what we are getting there. We're talking of celebrating 
the fullness in um, the joy. So any of those we are applicable. Nature is alive. Nature is full of joy. And therefore, that's why, that's why I'm talking about dancing upon my knee, the bed singing. So there is intensity of life, intensity of nature. So that's also coming in there. Intensity of life, intensity of nature. Fullness of life, fullness of nature. So those are the, the discussions that you can bring in there. Any two is applicable, therefore, so you have a variety of options that you can take. If we explain the use of imagery in lines 9 to 12 to describe nature, the use of imagery. All right, uh, when we talk about metaphor, I believe a metaphor will come in there because imagery is figures of speech, remember? So when we say line 9 to 12, we are talking about um, the earth is filled with beauty, the air is filled with song, the yellow thorn trees lot the wind. So when we say the egg is clothed with beauty, that's a metaphor. This one is definitely a metaphor. Let's take our metaphor there. And then it says, um, uh, the yellow thorn trees lot the wind with odors sweet and strong. That's personification. The air is filled with song. That's personification. So any of those were applicable, any of those two, we are applicable, you just have to take one and discuss. When we say the, the, the egg is clothed with beauty, I believe we're talking about the abundance of the beauty. Every part of nature is covered with beauty. I believe I touched on it when I was just discussing the poem and going down through it. And I talked about um, how earth is covered throughout with the, the, the beauty that is existing. Yes, I did. I said uh, it's given qualities of personified as wearing beautiful clothing. And I think I think the world, every part of the world is covered with beauty and that makes me very happy. And then also when we talk about uh, the trees full of flowers, sweet, strong, those are the things uh, that we are talking about. And then we talked about uh, the song. The song, yes, we can also talk about the song, which was joy. The air is filled with song, which means it's a happy environment. So it's joy, definitely. So those are the answers that are coming in. So you just have to give, remember when you're talking on your initial question, name your pick of speech. Um, as I said, personification, what is personified? Or what is metaphor? And then give its effectiveness in description of nature. In the description of nature. So that's what you are supposed to do today. So those are the things that are wanted on imagery questions. They are all the same. You just have to know your figure of speech. Imagery is another way for figures of speech. Discuss how the structure of line 13 to 16 emphasizes the message of this poem. Rhetorical question is there somewhere? Mm, we have a rhetorical question in line 16. Uh, okay, it says, uh, how does the structure of line 13 to 16 that we say deviate from the pattern of the senses? Uh, and therefore, we are now talking about um, there is a isolation, definitely. We have isolation existing there whereby now she does not appreciate, she does not talk about the senses, but now she is using the word never. Never, this one, never repeated twice. I never, I never. So we are going to also touch on that repetition of never, which means that she cannot see a way of appreciating nature, yet she is dealing with a grief. So she is trapped in her grief, that is blocking her from seeing uh, the beauty of the sun and its surroundings. We're also talking about the rhetorical questions. They, she cannot find answers to console herself. 
she cannot find answers to the importance of this beauty to her, yet she has gone through such a loss of um, a deceased child. So we are now talking about um, rejection. This lines deal with the rejection of the beauty of nature. Um, this one, that's our structure, rejection of the beauty of nature. Definitely. Explain the shift of tone in this poem in terms of the intention of the poet. Uh, we talk about the calm tone when we're doing the essay. Uh, I, I believe we, when we're doing the essay, we touch on how we identify tone. Okay, when we talk about the tone, we're talking about a joyful tone, cheerful tone, as she is appreciating the beauty of the morning and its surroundings. But it changes in the final four lines of the poem, line 13 to 16. It changes because now it's a despondent tone. It's um, um, because she has lost a child. Hopelessness is also dominating her. Um, and therefore, those are the things that we, we can touch on when talking about uh, this poem because she cannot find a way to move forward. as she does not have anyone to share it with. So our answer is based on a joyous, cheerful tone, line 1 to 12. It's a joyous tone. Cheerful tone. Birds chipping, singing, that's cheerful. A celebratory tone of the beauty of nature is also coming in. Any of those is applicable. Um, Therefore, but now because she's admiring the bountiful beauty of nature, beauty of nature, but it changes now in the last four lines to a tone of despair. Line thirteen to sixteen, it becomes a tone of despair. Hopeless is also applicable. If she does not see uh, the, the need to appreciate nature or uh, this beautiful nature is because of the loss. So the intention of the poet is to see the futility of the beauty of nature if we do not have anyone to share the So it's futility of the beauty of nature to her. If she does not have anyone to share it with, who the loss of a child. Okay. We continue now to uh, poetry number three, which is at the funeral for Valencia Majobosi, who died shortly after qualifying as a doctor by Dennis Griffiths. Black women go at Sunset Cake and Tree and stop at graves expectant of eternity and drive white lines, white bells, the Mrs. Gush, their bounty of red wine crops, stopping the buckles, catching slops, the loots, then ponder all this for long panel. He, for one, he speaks the mud divorce with our ox. Uh, and then it says, for all, all you frustrated ones, I was tuned in death, aborted not by death, but carrying food off. But arise, the brassy shouted feet upstairs our earth. Not death, but death's head tiring his side is our ground and lots our narrow cells of pain to put in death. Better that we should die than we should lie down. I remember doing this on another. Um, discussion on the same platform. I think it was the media the preparation for the media exam. I don't remember. But I remember the cut in this poem. My memory is coming back to me. Right. This is an um, apartheid poem, post apartheid poem. It was written post apartheid. But it is based on the brutality and the cruelness and the injustices of the struggles that were faced by the Black people during the apartheid era in South Africa. So as such, we're talking about 
senseless death. It was senseless because she was young and she had just, uh, what is this, qualified to become a doctor. But her dream of becoming a doctor was cut short as she died before she could wear the white robe of being a doctor. So now we're talking about questions about the meaning of life. Why is it that we have to face oppression to an extent that we experience death? Because her death is senseless. But now it challenges the reader to question um, and introspect about society. What is just and why do we call it just? What is unjust and why do we call it unjust? So now we are talking about um, the unpredictability of a death. Um, it shows the frustration of how her dreams were unfulfilled before her time. She died before her time, but it also brings the harsh reality by those who were facing apartheid system and the difficult times of the apartheid regime. So this poem now is based on true events, and therefore that's why it will have uh, what is this? The the explanation who it's for. So that's what we're going to touch on now. It starts off with the colors, green, gold, black, green, and gold. And those are the national colors of the ANC, the African National Congress. But they also symbolize the struggle against apartheid, basically. So as such, when we say symbolize the struggle against apartheid, because remember that was the movement that started the fight to end the apartheid regime. Sunset is not literal in that sense. And it says a sunset because it symbolizes um, death and brings in a somber mood. Day is ending and life is ending. But then she has life ended that day. So now it, that's why we call it symbolic. Um, it brings a somber mood where there's darkness, where there's sadness. Take entry. When we say take entry, we're talking about a shore that does not really have a meaning. So it's a ceremonial display which means that it's insignificant because um, there's a bigger stake that is at hand, which is the young doctor's death, Valencia's death. Doubled graves, they are neglected, they are untidy, they are covered in dirt, in grass, because they there's no one to take care of them. The graveyard is personified as being hungry, expectant of more deaths to come, which means there is more uh, violence that is going to to happen and more deaths are expected to arise. That's why the graves are given qualities of being expected when they are personified. Death is inevitable. That emphasizes that death is in inevitable. But now when we come in that uh, uh, eternity, expectant of eternity, Eternity is given as ambiguous there because it has two connotations. It's either that the dead will remain in their graves for eternity, or it can be referring to the afterlife will not end for them. So it's an ambiguous one there. Lines three to four talks about nurses attending the funeral wearing white bells, um, rides are brought in, innocence, purity, holiness, new life. So that line when we're talking about bright, when we're talking about nuns, we're talking about the color white because a bright is in white and nun is in white and they symbolize innocence, they symbolize uh, um, purity, they symbolize holiness, they symbolize new life. So now we're talking about frothing. It says frothing uh, 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 the bubbles, dating slops, the numbers, they came out in numbers. Um, that way, the, the nurses that were there to come and say goodbye to one of their own. Uh, it's almost like dirging is a military funeral, uh, but now it, it's also said uh, the, the earth is also, the rod itself is also now mourning a young doctor. So now there is um, a salute that is given an a explanation mark which is um, a movement saluting one of their own as a soldier would. So now we are talking about um, a call uh, for um, respect and action to happen. 
uh, but we're also going to talk about the whole of Hanoi in line four, five, or hello panel in line five, which is a meaningful ceremony with flags, speeches, uh, but they don't change anything. The speeches can be said at the funeral, but the injustices are still continuing when they go back to their uh, reality. Apartheid is still going to claim more lives because of the violence. So that's what we mean by hollow. Hollow means that it will not have meaning or an impact because nothing will change when they go back. That's why it becomes a seemingly meaningless ceremony. Um, line seven, the dead are described as powers tuned in depth. They um when they say powers tuned in death, it's because the the young ones have potential, but now they are now because of their deaths, they no longer have the the powers and the means to fully um have their futures and potentially what they could have become. And then we bring in the main issue of the poem, which is the period books of what um we are talking about the past past books. Um, whereby it was the symbol of the cruel apartheid laws. The apartheid government um, was more cruel than death itself because it says uh, they, they, their deaths, the black people's deaths, were, were described from birth because the books that they are given from birth are the ones that carry their death as well. That's a passport. So their potential is buried because of their deaths. The past books are symbolic there because they symbolize the cruel apartheid laws. The government is considered uh, um, to have used it as a, a ruling tool. Death and tyranny, there is also coming in where the skull and the crossbones insignia. I think when we in classes, we talked about the Nazis that it was used for the Nazis who are regarded as the greatest heroes by the South African regime because of their cruelty and their heartlessness. Therefore, it be, it's imitated by its people now. Um, it, it implies that it is better for people to die. Um, um, it is better for people to, to die during the resisting of apartheid and fighting against it rather than to give up or surrender. So, Surrendering for them is not physical, but what is physical is let's take arms, let's fight. So it's a call for resistance. All right, so that's the uh, Valencia Machombozi poem. Let's go to the question. It says, with reference to the teaching of Tanza 1, discuss how the poem or the poet alters the perception uh, of this funeral. Uh, colorful, pick and tree, I believe, is coming in. It's colorful. The entry is going to come in. We are counting it definitely. Um, black, green, and gold. The sunset also came in. We're just going to give you options. We're not going to align it to one answer. Green, gold is also going to come in because it's um, that's the perception. And then um, this one turns a one, not from line one, from turns a one. We can also talk about the whites, nuns, white veils. Red wine clocks, these white bells. It so comes in red, white. What is it? Red wine clocks also comes in. Any of those are applicable because they are jumping out. Um, but now, um, he also comes in and says, Holo panel now. Right, this yes, is hollow, which means meaningless. Take and tree meaning just for display. Black green and gold meaning that it's political, it's no longer about her now, not personal. So those are the answers that are coming in when we are doing um, this. So Holo was also, I know Holo Panopo was also applicable because it means it's meaningless. It does not have uh, application to their lives because when they go back, it will still be the same thing, so which means it is only for display. It is only for uh, 
making a, a what do we call this, um, a staged uh, a funeral of some sort, a staged life. So that's what we mean when you're coming in to talk about the panel, I believe. So any of those were applicable. Um, Next, the speeches will not change anything. I believe that's what I wanted. Legs, speeches will not change the situation. So that's what we wanted for. Okay. All right. Explain who the frustrated ones, powers, tuned in debt are in terms of the choir. Uh, when we say who the frustrated ones in line two, we are talking about um, the young people. Getting it with the young people, youths. That is educated, qualified. I'm sorry. We're talking about them being qualified as well. Their qualifications definitely come in there. Powers, doctors, but now um, tombed in, tombed in debt. We're talking about uh, killed by the apartheid system. And the apartheid system before they could fulfill their dreams or before they could accomplish anything, fulfill dreams, accomplish anything. So what does that we mean there? Anything. That's futile. They're definitely futile because they've not done anything to fulfill their dreams. And then it says, uh, with reference to the intention of the poem, poem comment on how the tone is very strong stance along the terms of two elements. Uh, look at it. Right. We are talking about um, um, intention of the poem, comment on how the tone evolves from stanza one to stanza two. All right. We are talking about um, stanza one, loss of hope over the hopeless tone. In stanza one is hopeless. Stanza one definitely hopeless, loss of your life before she could leave her dream. And then that's instance of one. Um, instance of two, call to arms, which is, um, what do you call that? Agent, yeah, we're talking about agent tone. Determined also comes in where she now talks about arise with a uh, submission mark for people to fight against apartheid. The jacket is also coming in here. Of the senseless death, rejected is also coming in. Senseless death of Valencia, uh, senseless loss of a life is also applicable. So, any of those you can take them and discuss them properly. I've just given so many options now. How does the structure of stanza two reinforce the message of the poet as presented in the final line? Um, in the final line, better that we should die than we should lie down. Um, need for resistance is in that final line before we can go up to the point of death. There is a need for res resistance, but also um, challenge to fight is also arising there. Um, what else? Um, we're also talking about uh, natural death. Yet people 
a pink hill. So the pain is in people are not dying naturally. People are being killed by the upper bit tyranny. So hopes taken away in stanza two, hopes taken away. Those are applicable now. Any of those we have to discuss. So the message is that um, there is a need to resist the apartheid system because people are not naturally dying. People are being killed. Their hopes are being taken away. They are being robbed of their uh, right future because uh, of um, the apartheid system and its cruelty or its tyranny. So any of those were applicable. I look forward to question number four. Question number four, it's the shipwreck. All right, clearly the case form is over. Emily, if you can find the last poem that I did with the young members, and they enjoyed it better than they enjoyed uh, staying here. I'm not surprised because staying here was very long, and then we finished with the shipwreck. The great storm is over. All have recovered the land, what to go down together into the building sand. Three for the sun salvation. Two, for the bony souls, neighbor and friend and bright and spinning upon the shores. How oh, they will tell the shipwreck uh, when the winter shakes the door till the children ask, but for the 40, did they come back no more? And the silent professors the story, and a softness that tell us I, and the children no further question, and only the ways reply. Right, let's go and see what we can say about this point. All right. Um, when we're coming to shipwreck, we're talking about four stanzas. That's the structure. We always discuss the structure when we begin. Four lines each, so it's a fixed structure. Uh, strict pattern in the rhyme scheme, I think it's clear. A, B, C, B, D, E, F, E, G, H, I, H, K, K, L, K. It's a fixed um, a pattern, it's a strict pattern. Um, Sounds like a ballad. Um, elegy of some sort as well. So those are the things that are coming in to this lyrical. Also comes in if you somewhat a lyrical poem. I think I'll stick for lyrical right now. A lyrical poem. Stands the one and two they have optimism in them. When we say optimism, it's the response of the news that four have survived. So when we say four have survived, they have recovered the land. We have optimism here in this too, whereby we are celebrating the four that have recovered. Uh, stand salvation, yeah. So that's um, stanza one and two. And then um, stanza three and four now, grieving and mourning dominates. This one of the 14, optimism of four survived. Um, but here it's grieving, and morning for the 14. For the 14. Okay, that have died. So that's what we are focusing on now uh, to come in. All right, let's go to the poem in detail. It has a lot of, it has a lot of punctuation, exclamation mark. It's really a poem that has beautiful questions to set on because of its lot of content and uh, uh, characteristics of a poem. Exclamation begins. Please start with the exclamation, happiness, excitement, capitalized as well. Um, emphasis on rejoicing. And then it says, the great storm is over. Another exclamation comes in in line one. It shows a relief as well. So the mighty storm has ended. The powerful storm has ended. There is a sense of relief. That's why there's a need to celebrate. So the celebration. But ironically, the happiness and the celebration is short-lived because only four have come back to the shore, while these 40 have gone down and drowned into the boiling sand. So we're saying only four survived, 40 drowned, no escape for them. Euphemism is used there when they say gone down together, that's euphemism definitely the respectful way, 40 gone down. Together, that's euphemism. And which is a um, respectful way of, of saying they have died. 
And then we continue now when he says, um, they've, they've been swallowed up when we say boiling sand, they've been swallowed up by the depths of the sea. Uh, raging sea. Sand is turning violently, raging sea. Horror of the situation, intense grief. That line now brings us to understand the grisly part. And then he says, ring, that's Anamatopia, ring for the skull salvation. That's a town bell uh, announcing the survivors returning home. Uh, exclamation under, uh, after skull salvation with his gratitude. Or oh, thank you for the limited few survivors, which is on the floor. That's the minimal number of, um, um, which brings more sorrow for them. And then he says, the ring of the church bell, it's, it's a funeral bell sounding slowly and to be heard clearly in its implications. Uh, senseless loss of life, devastation is felt there in that stanza. And then it says, um, body souls. And we say body souls, they are given an identity. Uh, now we know who they were. There's a neighbor, there's a friend, there's a young um, worker here. Um, there's a, a groom as well who passed away. So it's actually, we now realize um, was just newly married. Shock is now coming in. Um, now we, we, we it's short-lived. Their marriage is short-lived because the widow is not prison. The, 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 the bridegroom is not prison now. So now we also talk about uh, the senselessness of their death. They're swept and tossed around mercilessly, helplessly, fighting for their fate in a desperate situation. Shallow waters, which is the shores, sort of a tragic loss of lives is put in there. But now in standard three, is how will this story now be carried over to the younger generations? Because it has to be narrated. And that's where now the, the bigger issue lies. Uh, Harsh cold nature of winter away personified. Children are very curious at their young age and innocent and inquire and want to find out what really became of the 40 victims that were lost at sea. And therefore, the shock of the reality weighs down upon the children when they understand that there will be no return for those 40 years round. Explanation has to be given. When it's given, the children are aware. Is the story is told, the story is told to them. And then now, a silence, deathly silence spreads as the um, tale is told. Listeners process the loss. Mood is depressing now. It's mournful. The use of uh, a sadness, uh, the emphasis of the sadness is highlighted uh, when it's being narrated to the children. Pity is also coming in, sorrow, grief. Are dominating because no answers, no straight answers can be effectively given to the questions that the children ask, innocent questions, bold questions, direct questions. Um, because now the children finally get to understand and experience the pain of the adults who are actually narrating the story to them of the 40 people. So such melancholy is also dominating there because the children can feel the melancholy, the sorrow. Waves are personified. Silence of the adults as they try to give the, the, the young ones an answer. Silence of the children as they absorb the pain, the shock, the sadness of the adults. And therefore, um, not, there's nothing that can bring comfort. Not even the words, not even the old cliches, empty cliches. And uh, uh, what is this? Uh, uh, give any comfort to how they feel. Now we realize the sense of hopelessness prevails in the situation. So that's a poem that we are doing with when it comes to children. It has sweet. There is um, celebration, but there is loss in the same celebration. So as much as they are celebration, the coming back of the force of the land, they are at the same time in grief over the tragic loss of the 40 that we lost at sea. Let's go to the question. How is the tone in line one contradicted by the rest of standard one? When we say the tone in line one, it's joy and delight. 
glee, the storm is over. So we are talking of the tone of delight, joy, celebration that the storm is over. Tones that we can discuss is joy, delight, celebratory, and of them are applicable. We just need one. And then what do we say? Glee, the storm is over. That's what shows us this one, right? Any of those. Uh, but change is now contradicted. We say changes. Here it's celebrating of the storm being over. Being over. All right. And then it changes now to sadness. It changes to sadness. Loss. Because of the body lives. Because of the body lives lost. That's what we are talking about is a contradiction. So the celebration that is felt in the beginning of the stanza due to the storm being over is seen in the contradiction of the sadness that is felt, felt in the loss of the body that did not return from the sea. And then we continue and say, explain how the diction of the second stanza emphasizes the tragic impact of the shipwreck. When we say uh, diction, bony souls, uh, Body souls. We are also going to talk about uh, sympathy. Poor soul. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about uh, identity through neighbor. Yeah, we're taking that one. Neighbor. Yeah, talk about neighbor, talk about. Uh, Group, right groom, uh, friend. So that's what we, we bring in as well. Um, connection to the people, which means they meant something to the people in the community. And now we realize how loss has affected them. The loss has deeply affected them. So that's what we are talking about. Any of those is a big reference to Max. So you just have to discuss what you feel. Um, we're taking both of them. Bonnie souls, we can't live out. The listing of bridegroom, neighbor, friend, we can't live out. Show that they are connected, they are family members. Briefly comment on how the image out of Danza 3 is appropriate for telling the shipwreck. Personification, image are there. Remember, we talked about winter. Communication, I believe. Um, when we're talking about, uh, I believe the line we will take is uh, winter is personified as shaking the door. Yes. Personification of winter shaking the door. Winter shaking the door. Okay. When you say winter shaking the door. Uh, we are talking about um, harsh, cruel nature. Winter. I believe we have to bring in the loss of life. Yeah. It's connected to the loss of life. Aboard the ship. Go to the shipwreck. That's how we can come into play. Right. Just as the waves were harsh and cruel uh, and took what they liked, so is winter when shaking the doors is harsh and cruel and brings death as well. This has all the structure of this poem reinforces the message of the poem. The formal structure is we say it when we begin. Uh, but now it was three marks, which means we had to be very detailed. Uh, I believe we had to, exactly as we say it when we're discussing the poem at the beginning, it is a formal structure. And the different stanzas, four stanzas, and each stanza reflects on the stages of the shipwreck and after the shipwreck and the consequences of the shipwreck. We remember we say it's stanza one, it's a reaction of the people to the storm ending and the loss of lives. Second stanza, memorial service, impact on the community. Third and fourth stanzas, 
we are talking about the pain being passed down of the, the pain of the elders narrating and giving answers to the younger children and passing down the tale and narrating it. Um, and therefore, message of the poem being um, how a tragic event will not be forgotten and has a long-term impact on the people um, as both young and old cannot cope with the loss. I believe we say the young ones feel the pain of the adults as they are narrating. That's what we mean when we say it will not be forgotten for a long time. So that's what we meant there. All right. Those are our four prescribed poems that we have to do. We're going to touch finally on the unseen poem. We cannot run away from this one. We must be able to go through it and be able to um, make sense of our skills that we um gathered as we're doing our 12 prescribed our 12 prescribed poems and bring in our knowledge. Let's see what we have. We are all poets turning wounds into words. We are all poets turning wounds into words. We are all poets turning our joy into words. We are all poets expressing life through words. Poetry speaks where the wounds live in silence. Words conform to a story, letter by letter. Poetry can make things better. Also, poetry speaks in abundance. When romance filters through the heart, poetry transforms the weak with the universal relevancy. Poetry is the sun and the rain, speaking from the heart, allowing the minds of the men, of men and women to gain in the future. We are all poets turning wounds into words. We are all poets turning our joys into words. We are all poets expressing life through words. Oh, communication. Hmm. No, that's okay. The Definitely, let's go to the questions and see what we are saying. We, expression of our pain is what this poem is touching on, definitely. Um, our wounds are always, our pain and our wounds are always infused in silence. We live in silence and do not express them and we do not say anything, we suffer in silence. But poetry is the outlet for us to finally let go of the pain and um, transform our universe and transform our lives, transform each other. So I believe that's what we mean. Discuss the image contained in line four. Poetry speaks when the wounds live in silence. It says, discuss the image. It uh, speaks, poetry speaks as personification, definitely. Personification there. Poetry is given qualities of uh, speaking, talking, and um, Speaking for wounds, living in silence, right? Of um, poetry, which will be the mouthpiece. Will be the mouthpiece of wounds. Silence. All right. Our poetry. You know, expose, reveal, believe, um, suffering. And you are in secret, in silence. In silence. That's what we mean there. All right. And then says, comment on how the poet's use of fiction in the two emphasizes the message of the poem. It is the sun in the rain. No, no. it's poetry speaks when the wounds live in silence. Words conform to a story letter by letter. Poetry can make things better. Also, poetry speaks in abundance. When romance filters through the heart, poetry transforms the weak with the universal relevancy. Let's go back to the question again. It says comment on how the poet's use of Fiction number two emphasizes the message of the poem, transforms the weak transformation, which means it will empower them, it will strengthen them. I think I'm going to take transforms, transforms, strength, strengthen them. That's what's jumping out there. What else can we take? I believe we can also talk about. Um, 
abundance. It's not about abundance. And for you to speak in abundance, please. Mm -hmm. You can take, definitely take this one. When you say speak in abundance, it means that um, irrelevancy, whatever is going to be said, is going to be relevant for us and for everyone else. So if those are the words that are jumping out there, positive impact um, of poetry, these make things better. Those are the words that can come in. So, okay, for those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and make things better. Just positive transformation. That's jumping up there. When we're talking about, um, yeah, so those are the any of those we have picked up. We just wanted two, I believe. We have taken two when we touched on three, so any of those two was applicable. Um, let's go to the next one. We it says, comment on how to um, explain the tone of standard three. Let's go to standard three and listen to what it is that means. Poetry is the sun and the moon, speaking from the heart, allowing the mind of a man and a woman to gain in the future. Impact. Poetry, poetry has an impact, right? Poetry, spoken from the heart, I believe sincere, it's a sincere tone. I'm feeling sincerity there. A sincere tone, a tone of sincerity. I'm feeling a tone of sincerity because poetry has the uh, power is the impact um, to improve their lives by better future, by better futures. Those are the answers that are coming in. And then how does the structure of the poem reinforce the overall message? Um, let's look at it quickly. Okay, when you come to stanza one, you have a different, we are all quite telling the words. The only structure, the only part that you got is stanza two. And then the rest are three, 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 and this uh, are fine. All right, let, let, let's see what we say about this one. Um, the other one, touch your body, it's different element, right? It's the other one, you see, it says, We are all poets turning wounds into words, we are all poets turning our joys into words, we are all poets expressing life through words. The one is the power that is within the person writing the poem, which is a poet. And then stanza two now deals with what we have written and what it does, transformation. Stanza three, the impact of the poetry that has been written. And then the last stanza, it's a repetition. All right. All right. So it means when we're answering this question, we're going to touch on the three stanzas and the repetition of stanza four. All right. How does the structure of the poem be enforced? Um, reinforce uh, the overall message. Stanza one touches on the power that the poet possesses. Um, and uh, the trans uh, transformation is touched on stanza two of what the poetry written can do. Stanza three, people can actually uh, have a future and a purpose. So that poetry has a use for their lives. And the last stanza is a repetition of um, the first three lines, which is the first stanza. So, which means the overall message is the power of poetry to change lives. 
to make people open up and to actually express what they've gone through in silence, what they've endured, what cannot be done through normal speaking. That's our overall message there. That's our section A of the speaker. Unfortunately, we have to stop here today, but I hope it was hopeful. It was hopeful for you when it came to the prescribed poems that you were doing. In the next session, we will touch on section B and C, which is our novels, and our play, which is section C, to try and put together our feed part. A good evening to our feed folks. Thank you for your time. Good morning to grade 12. We are looking at um, English Home Language Paper 2, which is a continuation of the question paper that we started with Section A. Um, and as such, we are now going to focus on Section B and Section C and uh, close it off. We are looking at our novels and then we are looking at our plays. So we are going to base our discussions on the questions that are in this question paper and therefore we'll make sure that uh, we try and uh, piece together the mapping of our themes, characters and um, everything that has to do with um, the play and the novel. Okay, without wasting any time, let's go to the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde and our discussion will be based on this essay which says, according to Wikipedia, immorality is the violation of moral laws, norms, or standards. It refers to an agent doing or thinking something they know or believe to be wrong. Immorality is normally applied to people or actions, or in a broader sense, it can be applied to groups or corporate bodies and works of art. In a well-constructed essay of 400 to 450 words, which is roughly two to two and a half pages, discuss whether Dorian Gray can be considered a completely immoral character or whether he is merely a victim of influence. Okay, when we're coming to the picture of Dorian Gray, we must understand that we look at it from an angle of um, immorality according to the question. So as such, we need to now discuss whether Dorian is independently immoral or whether he is a victim of influence. Uh, when we start off, we definitely agree that he was a victim of influence. He is a victim of influence. We maintain the present tense, and therefore the influence, when it takes uh, um, over and uh, control, ultimately pushes him now to make independent decisions, and therefore we cannot condone him because he made the decisions knowingly and uh, fully aware of their consequences. All right, let's get uh, to our question and see what we can bring up. We are exploring this too, the morality and the influence. So let's try and see whether our complex character was Dorian Gray is going to bring up all of this. Remember when we're writing the essay question, we always use our peel. May we never forget that we follow our peel method. So please let's make sure that we discuss using the pill. Let's make sure that we discuss using present tense as well. We must maintain the present tense. You must be able to produce the 400 to 450 words, which is two to two and a half pages. We always use this as our guide. This will always take us to making sure we've given, and given Mark has everything they need. And roughly we're talking about six to eight paragraphs of discussion that can come in for you to give valid points and discuss them in the pill method. So as such, we must be able to bring it across. All right, let's see what we come up with when we come to Doreen Gray. Firstly, let's look at um, the influence. We're going to talk about the external influence. Our first point, wait, let's take this down a little bit. Okay, we're going to talk about the external influence from um, um, who, uh, from Basil in the portrait. So when we are talking about external influence, we must be able to break down what we mean. Right. 
we're going to talk about external influence. We're going to also talk about um, immoral character. Right, so those are the two things we will consider today. When we talk of external influence, we are definitely going to bring in the portrait um, by Basil. When we talk of the portrait, we're talking about um, the need for eternal beauty. Eternal beauty. We're also going to talk about Lord Henry. I'll just write the image there and his influences. So as such, these are the things that come in as external influence. We're going to talk about the yellow book. It also comes in there. So those are the uh, external influences that we mean when coming to um, Dorian Gray. Uh, but now when we talk about immoral uh, behavior of Dorian Gray, we are going to um, talk about his choices. Yes. Um, when we talk about choices, Killing Basil definitely comes in. Uh, blackmailing Ellen Campbell comes in. Right. That's where we see his immoral character. And therefore, we must be able to bring it out because those were conscious choices that he made. So when you're talking about immorality with Dorian, we're talking about conscious choices. We must be able to specify. So we're just opening up and making sure before we write our essay, we know exactly what we're going to do. Now let's see how far we can go because when we are counting and saying it's your pill, six to eight paragraphs, there's your first point, there's your second point, there's your third point, there's your fourth point, there's your fifth point, which means we, we can add something as well. Um, Sibyl Vane, treatment of Sibyl Vane also comes in, definitely. Treatment of Sibyl Vane. That's coming in as well. We are going to also talk about that one. Um, because that shows his um, moral journey towards uh, 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 destruction. So those are the things that we might bring in here and there. And therefore, let's try and um, discuss fully. All right. I'm, I'm just going to be discussing so that you can be able to understand what I mean when I say the portraits, the North Indies influences the yellow book so that we can be able to do that. All right, let's start with um, Lord Henry's influences. I, I believe that's where we start off from. Um, Lord Henry is a philosopher and Lord Henry's uh, um, obsession with Dorian clearly pushes him to make Dorian an experiment. But now we're going to talk about his philosophy of um, hedonism aesthetism, um, you will grow old and not be this beautiful anymore. Enjoy life while at least you're still young. So those are the things that we're talking about. But his philosophies in the garden scene uh, definitely promote um, and push Dorian to uh, deviate from the normal norms of society. Because now Dorian becomes uh, um, eager to embrace these ideas that Lord Henry gives him. So he is entranced and captivated by Lord Henry's rhetorical philosophies because he keeps re repeating them. So as a result, from the expression of the philosophies, we get to uh, see Dorian uh, uh, desiring to become young forever. We see Dorian desiring to explore a new life of pleasure seeking so those are the philosophies that we're talking about when we say those are the external influences that lead dorian to his transformation 
So what do we mean by transformation? Dorian is a virtuous, a, a, a naive, innocent young man who unfortunately is entangled um, into a morally corrupt uh, mm -hmm. philosophical man who is Lord Henry and therefore um, becomes influenced. The influences from Lord Henry become successful to a point because Lord Henry is so charismatic. Lord Henry is so fluent and uh, um, very easy with the tongue, which now becomes the key role in Dorian becoming uh, morally corrupt. So definitely we are saying Lord Henry's philosophies promote Dorian to want to indulge uh, from the indulge in new experiences that he is uh, explained to by Lord Henry. And therefore, that's the external influence that we mean to say the philosophies play a very significant factor when it comes to Dorian's moral corruption. His choices as he makes going on are now influenced by these ideas. In other ways, we're seeing Lord Henry's philosophy becomes the foundation and the basis of the moral, immoral choices that Dorian makes. So we also going to talk about the portrait because immediately after the garden scene, we we find um, Dorian going back to the studio with Basil uh, to see the the finished portrait. When he sees the finished portrait he realizes for the first time how beautiful he is. When he realizes how beautiful he is, he now desires to become beautiful forever. And therefore that's when he wishes uh, for the portrait to remain, uh, to take his place and he remains young forever, which means the portrait must grow old and he must remain young. The first and bargain being the immorality that arises from Lord Henry's philosophies. So it is a chain of events because the the philosophies that Lord Henry instills in him in the garden scene to that his beauty will not last forever uh, pushes Dorian to go and make the first end bargain when they are back in the studio with Basil. And now we realize that the portrait now, when the first end bargain is made, he, his soul exchanges with the portrait. So now we realize that when he loses his soul, that is the start of his immorality. When he now is uh, uh, um, free from uh, um, any, any guilt, he becomes immoral. So the portrait is also something which is symbolic when it comes to Dorian's true nature. Uh, it's a mirror that unveils the darkness in him or within him. So as such, the portrait gradually deteriorates um, as he sins more in the real world. Therefore, that shows his inner moral decay. So when Dorian engages in a lot of sins, I always call them sins. The immoral uh, uh, acts that he does, I call them sins. When he engages in those immoral sins or acts, the portrait becomes increasingly distorted it becomes increasingly grotesque. So as such, the, the transformation is now the, the, the proof that Dorian started off as a victim of external manipulation, uh, but now he is an active participant in his own moral degeneration. So which means he willingly becomes immoral because he realizes that the more he does the, the, the sinning, the less society knows and the less it is on him because it is only a reflection or a mirror in the portrait. So now we, we realize the symbolism of the portrait because that's, that's the thing in the book that gives us Dorian's true nature. So... That's what we mean when we're talking about external influence, about the portrait, about Lord Henry. Let's go to the yellow book. The yellow book is given as a, a present from Lord Henry. And therefore, unfortunately, it's the one that, I, I, I'll say I, ironically, 
the influencer who's Lord Henry gives Dorian the yellow book and ironically the yellow book uh, replaces the influencer because when he's given the yellow book by Lord Henry, he now adapts to the yellow book and therefore uh, moves less from Lord Henry's grasp. The yellow book is an aesthetic symbol, symbol in the book because it has to do with, um, what do we call it, colors. Uh, we know symbolism of colors, different days as have different colors, yellow, blue, whatever it is. But now when we see him, uh, uh, binding the book in the different colors and adapting to the character and therefore he takes the character's uh, life and brings it to himself we now realize that it becomes uh, uh, something that he transits into so he becomes a full hedonist and aesthetic uh, uh, symbol when he leaves out the yellow book buying things unnecessarily that he doesn't even need or use, the purchasing of a lot of uh, um, material things. So changing moods according to the colors and the days, that's when we realize that he leaves it out. We do agree that it is an external influence that's given to him, but he actually now leaves it out and becomes the immoral character that it is. And therefore, that's where we realize that there is a very intricate pattern with, uh, from external influence to the immoral character that he becomes. The, the immoral character and external influence end up intertwining. Why? Because it becomes complex. It starts off as external influence and ultimately leads to his immorality. And therefore, that's why we, when you are discussing, you must be able to state what the external influence is and what it ultimately leads to. They are stepping stones. So the portrait, Lord Henry's influence, the yellow book, are stepping stones to Dorian's immoral character, becoming more degraded, becoming more grotesque as the portrait becomes. So that's how we are now bringing in those things. And then when we also talk about... Um, the yellow book, I believe he, that's where the full aestheticism of Dorian is seen. And we must be able to bring it out that um, when we say fully uh, aesthetic, we, we, we are talking about um, the, the issue of um, um, corrupting influence on his youth. Um, and, and as such, he changes and uh, is led by the moods and the colors that influence his life. And that's what we bring now. So let's sum up the external influence before we move on to the immoral character. The portrait, it definitely symbolizes the changing state of Dorian's soul. The yellow book, it represents a, a, a Dorian at an older uh, uh, age and his Corrupt, corruption becoming more uh, intense. Um, wh when we are bringing in the portrait, we're talking about the start of his, of losing his soul and leading to his immorality. So that's what we mean when we're talking about the, the three things. Let's go to the moral character. The choices that he makes knowingly cannot be ignored. Killing Basil was a a conscious choice. Why? Basil made him face, face his true self and what he has become. Basil being in denial more and more and still wanting to defend him as his voice of reason angers Dorian because the more Basil uh, defends him and saying you are not what you have become, you need to repent uh, 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 change your ways the more now Dorian resents Basil and that's why he easily blames Basil for what he has become that builds to hatred which pushes him to consciously step Basil several times and we now realize his immorality when after killing Basil he terms his corpse a thing he cannot look at it, he calls it a thing and becomes detached emotionally. 
from a mentor that Basil uh, uh, became in his life to a corpse that he calls him now uh, and to a thing that he calls his corpse makes us realize the immorality in Dorian and the extent to what it has become. And as such, we're also going to talk about the blackmailing of Ellen Campbell, knowing very well that Ellen would have refused to come. He writes on the note, um, uh, uh, he writes uh, something on the note, which when Ellen reads, uh, pushes him to, forces him to come uh, uh, to Dorian and do as he bids. We now realize that whatever he wrote on the piece of paper was damning uh, evidence against Ellen or was a reminder or was a threat, blackmail as we call it. And therefore Ellen comes. He knowingly blackmailed Ellen Campbell uh, um, and as such he forces him to come and dispose of Basil's corpse and therefore that's what we call by immorality in Dorian. Already uh, Ellen did, did not want anything to do with Dorian but he is blackmailed and therefore comes and does the deed all the same because of what Dorian holds over him. That is what we call immorality in Dorian or the immoral character that he has become, the extent of his cruelty, the extent of uh, uh, corruption on another soul and still continuing to corrupt him. Ultimately, Ellen Campbell commits suicide because he realizes that Dorian will not stop. As much as he had promised that he will not contact him, he did contact him and blackmail him to uh, come and dispose of the body using chemicals um, of Basil. And therefore, that's what ultimately leads Basil, um, Ellen Campbell to commit suicide is he cannot bear the thought of uh, uh, doing something else for Dorian again. He knowingly pulls in Ellen Campbell into his uh, scheme and forces him to do the unthinkable, which is to dispose of a body. And therefore that's corruption on Ellen Campbell again. So we're also going to talk about um, the cruelty treatment of Sybil. Consciously rejects Sybil and is cruel to her after her performance of uh, uh, um, portraying her true feelings of love on stage. He denies her and says he does not want anything to do with her again because she was not the Juliet that he wanted on stage or, 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 or the character that Sybil was supposed to portray for his uh, uh, aesthetic enjoyment and artistic enjoyment. And therefore, he now uh, uh, is cruel to Sybil. So that's what we, we are talking about when coming to how consciously corrupt uh, Dorian is. So this is what we are talking about uh, when it comes to uh, this essay. It's a discussion. So we realize that he believes that when he is cruel to Sybil, it's because he still wants to see the artistic uh, uh, Sybil on stage, the Elizabeth, the Juliet or whatever character she's supposed to be, despite it being wrong. But we realize now uh, the extent of his immorality when the next morning uh, he sees, um, early hours of the morning, he sees the line of cruelty on the mouth of the, of the portrait. And then he decides that he will go and apologize to Sybil uh, to make it right. And then when he hears of her death from uh, Lord Henry, he he decides to continue with the hedonistic life and the same evening uh, of the same day that he discovers Sybil uh, has passed away, he goes to the theater and uh, continues with his um, hedonistic lifestyle. This is where we're talking about immorality now. To say he does not grieve for Sybil, uh, is detached, and therefore continues with his life as if nothing has happened. So those are the things that we are touching on uh, when it comes to this essay, because definitely we consider him both. He becomes completely immoral. That's very true. He started off as, a, as merely a victim of influence, but he continues as an immoral character, knowingly, consciously 
and uh, all decisions that he makes now as an adult are based on him going back to check the portrait in the schoolroom and see what it has become, uh, lock the, the portrait, put the key in his breast pocket and continue with life. So that's what we mean. When we are also talking about how he influences Lord Kent's son and how the rumors in society are spreading that he destroys uh, the lives of the young men. That's the immoral character we're talking about. And therefore, I believe Lord Kent's son is one example. I believe Adrian Singleton is another one that he introduced to this hedonistic life and corrupt life. But now, unfortunately, Adrian Singleton loses himself and is even physically degraded. So those are the things that we are talking about when it comes to his immoral character. So as such, which means this question touches on both parts of Dorian Gray, being in a victim of external influence, but ultimately becoming an immoral character, willingly, consciously, because it's based on his choices. So that's what we are touching on when it's coming to this essay. Practice essay writing, please, before we write our paper too, and make sure that as long as you have your points, you are able to have a fully fleshed essay. I always guide my learners to say, please plan your points as I have done as well, to say, I have that point, I have that point, I have that point, which will guide you to making sure you touch on the points. Ultimately, all of them will be discussed and you can have some full marks being given to you. So as such, just try it out and practice before the exam starts so that you can get... Uh, um, uh, maximum points when it comes to any essay that you are going to choose, uh, whether it's a play or a novel. All right, let's continue to our context questions of Dorian Gray. All right, question seven. Yes, it's this one. All right, when we come to question seven, it's based on the extracts, right? And our extract is from chapter, chapter four. All right, let's go and see what we had. I will tell you, Harry, but you mustn't be unsympathetic about it. After all, it never would have happened if I had not met you. You filled me with a wild desire to know everything about life. For days after I met you, something seemed to throb in my veins. As I lounged in the park or strolled down Piccadilly, I used to look at everyone who passed me and wonder with a mad curiosity what sort of lives they led. Some of them fascinated me. Others filled me with terror. There was an exquisite poison in the air. I had a passion for sensations. Well, one evening about seven o'clock, I was determined to go out in search of some adventure. I felt that this gray, monstrous London of ours, with its myriads of people, its sordid sinners and its splendid scenes, as you once phrased it, must have something in store for me. I fancied a thousand things. The mere danger gave me a sense of delight. I remembered what he had said to me on that wonderful evening when we first dined together about the search for beauty being the real secret of life. I don't know what I expected, but I went out and wandered eastward, soon losing my way in a labyrinth of grimy streets and black rustless squares. About half past eight, I passed by an absurd little theater with great flaring gas jets and gaudy playbills, a hideous jewel. And the most amazing waistcoat I ever beheld in my life was standing at the entrance, smoking a vile cigar. Yet grisly ring ringlets, and an enormous diamond placed in the center of a salt shed. I have a box, my lord, he said, when he saw me, and he took off his head with an air of gorgeous servility. There was something about him, Harry, that amused me. He was such a monster. You will laugh at me, I know, but I really went in and paid a whole guinea for the stage box. To the present day, I can't make out why I did so. And if, yet if I hadn't, my dear Harry, if I hadn't, I should have missed the greatest romance of my life. I see you are laughing. It is horrid of you. All right, let's go to our questions. This is from chapter four. Refer to lines three to four, it says. Uh, okay, let's quickly go and see what line four say up to veins. It says, for days after I met you, something seemed to throb in my veins. That's what we are using as the basis of this question. Explain what something is. Um, explain what the something is that Dorian mentions. Okay, uh, curiosity, 
I believe plays a big part here. Yes, I believe we're going to touch on curiosity. Okay, uh, let's go touch on yes. Curiosity is one of them. Um, curiosity of uh, new things, unknown things. Definitely. Uh, I believe we can also talk about excitement. To experience new things. Passion also comes in here for new experiences. The new experiences also comes in. So this is what we can refer to uh, when it comes to this. Uh, and I believe uh, we, we are talking about the issue of that. Uh, he's feeling free to explore, explore, discover, free to explore, discover things that he did not know before or did not have the courage to do before. So that's what we are touching on. Refer to line six to seven. Then there was an, okay, let's quickly go back and see what we are talking about. It says, then there was an exquisite poison in the air. All right, it says, comment on the effectiveness of this image. When we say uh, poison in the air, um, I believe what is dangerous to him is now attractive. What is danger is, is attractive to him. He is attracted to danger. Dorian is attracted to dangerous things. Unknown territory. The thrill of it is what we're talking about here. And I believe when you say there was poison in the air, that, that will be a metaphor, right? Ah, the metaphor. Definitely a metaphor. That's the if image that we're talking about. So we, we are definitely bringing in um, poison is, is dangerous, but something exquisite is beautiful, attractive. So that's what we mean. Can be an oxymoron as well. Yeah, can be an oxymoron because we have poison, but also exquisite. So that's oxymoron. It's total opposite. Poison is dangerous, but we're talking of beautiful and uh, attractive. So that's what we mean. And then 7.3, by looking closely at the diction used to describe London, discuss how Oscar Wilde's opinion of the city is revealed. I believe to talk about sorted sinners, right? Grey monsters, grimly streets. Uh, filthy is what is coming into mind. Dirty, sorted. Those are the ideas that are coming in there. Uh, we're also talking about um, um State of decay, that's what we mean. Critically discuss what Dorian's description of the theater manager reveals about his character. It is Jew, I believe, yeah. Let's go back to that description. I believe he said it is Jew. Yes, it is Jew, yes. In the most amazing waistcoat I ever beheld in my life was standing at the entrance, smoking a vile cigar. He had a he had grisly ringlets and an enormous diamond placed in the center of his sold shirt. Have a box, my lord, he said when he saw me. All right, all right. He was such a monster. Uh, all right. Vile cigar. All right. All right. Hideous. So that's a description that he gives us. We just had to go back and see exactly what was said. All right, what does it reveal about his character according to those descriptions? 
I, I believe um, he, he is showing a bias that's prejudiced, right? Yeah, he's prejudiced against the Jew. He's prejudiced, sorry. Prejudice. He is prejudiced against the Jew, definitely. Uh, and also, I believe... Um, Standards, fashion standards, criticizes his, criticizes his um, fashion standards, demeans him. I think those are the things that are coming in when it comes there. Uh, Judgmental, just as society has been judgmental. Just as society is judgmental to those that are, the elite are judgmental to those that are in lower class. And he's doing exactly that. Explain why Dorian's belief in 7.5 that he has discovered the greatest romance of his life is ironic. Definitely irony. What are we talking about? Uh... For Dorian, it is not love. I think we all know that. He's not in love. He's really not in love with Sibel, but he's in love with the characters that she plays. So the irony is in... Um, irony is in not in love with Sibel. But in love with the characters... Civil plays, civil plays on stage. I think we talked about it above in the essay when we say that Juliet, that she is when it's Romeo and Juliet. So that's what we're talking about. All right, Cleopatra, when she's playing Cleopatra on stage, is what he is in love with. So that's the irony that we're talking about. Uh, that's why as soon as she displeases him by not acting well, he loses his love for her. I believe we call it loses and put it in quotes because he is cruel to her because he says he is not in love with her anymore. So that's the love that we're talking about because it's not love, it's this one that we put in quotes. Thank you. Just as we put loses in quotes. All right, let's go to extract B. All right, extract B is from chapter 10. All right, let's go to the questions. Uh, let's go to the extract quickly so that we know what we're dealing with. It says, I don't want to put it straight left. I only want the key. Well, sir, you will be covered with cobwebs if you go into it. Why? It hasn't been opened for nearly five years, not since his lordship died. He winced at the mention of his grandfather. He had hateful memories of him. That does not matter, he answered. I simply want to see the place. That is all. Give me the key. And here is the key, say, said the old lady, going over the contents of her bunch with tremulously uncertain hands. Here is the key. I'll have it off the bunch in a moment, but you don't think of living up there, say, and you so comfortable here. No, 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 he cried petulantly. Thank you, Liv, that will do. She lingered for a few moments and was garrulous over some detail of the household. He sighed and told her to manage things as she thought best. She left the room, wreathed in smiles. As the door closed, Dorian put the key in his pocket and looked up and looked round the room. His eye fell on a large purple satin coverlet heavily embroidered with gold. A splendid piece of late 17th century Venetian work that his grandfather had found in a convent near Bologna. Yes, that would serve to wrap the dreadful thing in. It had perhaps served often as a pole for the dead. Now it was to hide something that had a corruption of its own, worse than the corruption of death itself. Something that will breed horrors and yet will never die. What the worm was to the cops, his sins will be to the painted image on the canvas. They would mar its beauty and eat away its grace. They would defile it and make it shameful. And yet the thing will still live on. It will be always alive. Explain why Dorian winced at the mention of his grandfather. Okay. Uh, 
uh, we we remember that uh, the grandfather did not approve of his mother's marriage uh, as the as Dorian's father was a servant. So the grandfather had the father killed. So he did not treat Dorian well. That's why he kept him secluded most of the times in the schoolroom. So I believe it is the, 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 the wincing is because of the treatment from the grandfather towards him being locked in the schoolroom for a long time and his um, disapproval of the mother's marriage and having the father killed. Comment on Dorian's view 7.7 .7 of the painting is a dreadful thing. When we say dreadful thing, we realize uh, he, he, ugliness. He sees the ugliness that it has become 